Chance meeting on the 29th of June. I have a statement to read before we start the meeting. I am Councillor Gardner, the Chair of the Audit and Accounts Committee. And I would like to welcome everyone to the meeting which is being held virtually and in accordance with accountant rules for virtual meetings which reflect the recently published government regulations. The meeting is being streamed live on YouTube, will also be available to view after the meeting has finished. Councillors who sit on this committee are identified by name on the screen, and I will introduce the officers by name before they address the committee. Councillors are reminded that although this meeting is being held remotely, they are regarded as being present in a meeting of the council, and they should observe the normal rules of behaviour under the Member Code of Conduct, not allow members of their household to distract them during the course of the meeting. Can members ensure that their mobile phones are now switched off or are on silent? If you go to mute, you can do what you like while you're muted, but um, not while you're live. Members of the committee will turn on their video link during the meeting and keep their microphones muted unless they have been invited to speak by myself as the chair. Members are reminded that if they switch off their video link or move away from the camera, they will be treated as, having, as leaving the meeting and will not be able to take part in any vote taken on the item under discussion. That's probably academic because we very rarely have a vote. Members can indicate their wish to speak by raising their hand. I should be able to see everybody. Should only speak when I as chair invite them to do so. I should probably be muted. You can say what you like, but nobody will take any notice. As chair, I will confirm the name of any visiting speaker at the appropriate time in the agenda who will address the committee by audio link. Councillors should declare they are leaving the meeting and switch off their video link if they have a disclosable pecuniary interest or other personal interest on any item of the agenda. The councillors can switch on their video link when I call the next agenda item. Voting will be taken by a roll call and I will confirm the recommendation proposed to the committee before the voting begins. Each member can indicate whether they are for, against the recommendation, or whether they wish to abstain. Hopefully we will not have any IT problems. I can assure councillors if their connection is lost, they should immediately advise the Democratic Support Officer and use their meeting link to access the meeting again. Item one. Apologies for absence and substitutions. I have two apologies. Councillor Gavin James, um, who is unable to attend meetings in the afternoon and I have promised him that our next meeting will be an evening meeting, and Councillor Tilbury, who has work commitments. Item two, any declarations of interest? Anybody want to wave their hand at this point? I think scratching your ear doesn't count, Councillor Freeman. <laughs> Urgent matters, any? That's one for Ellie. No, none. Thank you. Right, item four, minutes of the meeting held on the 27th of January. Can those be taken as a true record? Or does anybody want to raise anything under that? Councillor Bo? Oh, thumbs up, okay. <laughs> That's all in agreement, we can accept that. The recommendation tracker had two items on it, both of which have been dealt with. So I think we can take that as noted. Thank you. Item six, the property investment strategy, year end report. And that is going to be introduced by Daniel Cohen. Cohen, Daniel, are you there? Good afternoon, I'm Councillor Gardner. I'm just, just a slight uh, change. It's actually my um, colleague who's also on the call, uh, Martin Jones, is going to be introducing that, if that's okay, to the committee. I don't think we have any objection to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, th thank you, Chair. And by introduction, my name is Martin Jones. I'm the new head of, uh, sort of property and assets, uh, joined back in uh, sort of May. And I'm introducing the uh, sort of report uh, on the property investment uh, uh, strategy um, 
and uh, sort of run through that. Uh, you will have seen the attached cabinet report. Uh, it uh, continues the work started uh, in 2017, 2018 to deliver additional income of some 1.7 million pounds uh, per annum to the property by the end, uh, to the council by the end of 2020, 2021. Uh, through property acquisitions and active asset management of the uh, sort of property portfolio. Uh, one notable acquisition took place in uh, quarter three of last year at the value of 7.15 million. Uh, the total investment spend to date therefore for the year is 22.09 uh, million, uh, which provides an additional 1.75 million pounds uh, per annum uh, rental income. And that's outlined as well in appendix uh, number uh, one. Uh, it should be uh, noted as well that the new acquisitions have been valued as part of the valuation process. Uh, the portfolio uh, has a value as at uh, the end of March, um, the, the new acquisitions of 31.7 million, which reflects um, a, a, a small fall on the previous uh, sort of valuations. And, but includes the B and Q acquisition at 7.15 million, uh, including the uh, future agreement of uh, uh, Ellie Lilly. The total cost of investment fund was 32.49 million. That's 2.49 million of capital, which will be replaced because it slightly exceeds the budget of uh, 30 million pounds. Uh, the actual income for 2019 to 2020 uh, was 1.29 million, which was uh, 60,000 higher than the budget. And uh, this accounts for uh, sort of partial years of the b and income. Uh, with the completion of the investment program, uh, property services will continue to monitor and market the potential opportunities with a focus on active estate uh, and asset management of the existing portfolio, review and investment uh, performance and rebalance in the portfolio to meet investment returns as outlined in the property investment plan approved by cabinet in February 2020. And uh, the committee are uh, asked to uh, sort of note the progress of uh, um, uh, this stream of work and um, if it has any uh, sort of queries to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Right, um, I think I'll raise the, the first question, which is there was talk uh, about recouping the excess expenditure from property disposals. How is that progressing? Yes, that's uh, progressing uh, well. Pro uh, three uh, properties have been identified uh, so, so far and additional uh, work is uh, taking place on those properties, preparing them to uh, sort of go to market. Um, we will be sort of looking to enhance the value by undertaking some planning work, some outline consents or planning statements, and it is hoped that those uh, sort of properties will go to the market in the next three to six months. Sounds good. Anybody else? That's the Cubit. Yes, hello, uh, good afternoon, um, Martin. Um, just um, uh, looking at um, uh, page 26 of the pack, um, it's the table of acquisitions. Right. Um, I just wonder whether you could talk me through the units one and two of Winchester Road, because it looks like the valuation on that uh, acquisition has lost 1.8 million um, uh, between the uh, total cost of acquisition of 6.01, the valuation as at 31st 03.19 and the subsequent further reduction in valuation as at 31st of the 12th, 2020, uh, what? Valuation as at 31st of the 12th, 20. Hmm, okay. How, how, we've, how, we've, how do we know what the value is gonna be at the end of December? 
So that's the secondary question. Anyway, yeah. There you go. Um, <laughs> well, valuations are, are uh, sort of uh, undertaken at fixed points. And if, if I could ask uh, sort of my colleague as well, uh, uh, Dan uh, Cohen, to uh, uh, sort of assist me in this as some of it precedes my time. Um, yes, thank you for the uh, question, Councillor um, Cubitt. Um, the, the annual asset valuation, the second question first, um, was actually um, carried out um, early this, this, uh, this last round. It was actually valued as at the 31st of the 12th. Um, at the request of the Executive Director of Finance um, to try and bring forward the process. However, we did um, do a further supplementary market review. Um, uh, was carried out by um, a different um, uh, asset valuation consultant to, to bring the, to, to assess any difference in valuations between the 31st of March, um, so 31st of December 20. Um, 20, 29, sorry, 2019 and uh, the 31st of March 20. Um, so, so that was actually um, carried out. But um, the last round of valuations on the 31st of December 2019 were actually carried out by, by Colliers, who also carried them out in uh, the 31st of the 3rd 19. And they would just probably reflect um, market um, conditions at that particular time. Um, sorry, um, sorry, am I being a bit stupid, but on my page 26, it says valuation as at 31st of the 12th of 2020. Is that a typographical error then? Yes, I do apologise. That, okay. that is a typographical error there. Okay, okay. So that's the first question. That should, that so that, should be, so sorry, that, 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 that makes sense because, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, quite frankly, I don't know how anyone's going to value property today, <laughs> let alone predict the impact of the coronavirus uh, pandemic on the valuations of our commercial real estate portfolio, which is this another issue I want to go into in a bit more depth in a minute. But going back to my question on the 1.8 million hit that we seem to have taken on that uh, acquisition, what's the background behind that? Because I, I, I don't think I was uh, aware that we had taken a capital uh, loss, uh, albeit value from a valuation perspective, because we haven't crystallized the loss yet. Um, I, I I do believe, Councillor Cubitt, I will probably have to go away and just um, come back to you directly on that on that matter, if I may. Um, my understanding is that obviously they 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 looked at the, the um, various evidence at the time. We, we also had undertaken a rent review on one of the assets within um, Winchester Road. Um, I understand it's more likely to be um, fresh market evidence of um, um, retail warehouse transactions will have come to light at that time. But uh, I will come back to you. Um, if I may, after the meeting with some further detail on that. that okay, okay, brilliant. And, and just and just because I'm not um, completely knowledgeable on this, but um, and there's a reference made by the auditors later on about how councils can get confused about capitalizing revenue, et cetera. And so we, we, we make this statement that we're on track for revenue of 1.7 with an additional 0.6 uh, coming down the road. But, uh, and we're, we're looking at some of the uh, investments doing really well, which is great, which is why the overall portfolio, albeit that the investment doing 22 million is showing a 30, 31. If we were to suddenly have another reevaluation um, mid pandemic crisis and the portfolio was sub the original initial uh, outlay, um, does that get, does that get, um, uh, um, um, uh, does that impact the revenue or is it tra treated as completely separate? Uh, I, I, because it's a portfolio, it's an investment portfolio. Yeah, I, I think uh, the present situation is uh, with a pandemic is going to cause uh, sort of issues with certain sectors uh, sort of within the property portfolio, most notably the, uh, the retail sector and the uh, sort of properties in the, um, uh, the malls, for example. Uh, additionally, there might be a double hit with um, uh, the um, retail stock being uh, slightly downgraded uh, uh, on that element. But on the plus side, and I'll, I'll, I'll let Dan come in as well if he uh, wants to, a lot of the uh, sort of portfolios, uh, the majority of the council's portfolios are on long ground leases which are uh, traditionally very, uh, very safe and uh, um, can um, smooth out some of the bumps in the uh, uh, sort of investment market. I think Philip Hood wanted to come in on that as well. 
You there, Philip? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, just to say, uh, from an accounting point of view, if there's a change in the capital value, that won't show through into our, our revenue income until the, the actual asset was disposed of. So it becomes just a valuation change, which affects the balance sheet, but doesn't change the actual investment income. Okay, brilliant. And then, can, just um, Mr. Chairman, if I could just ask one last question, which is there, is there are references, and of course we who read the newspaper are all aware, that rental holidays have been uh, allocated to uh, uh, a number of companies and we have been granting rental holidays to some of our retail sector. W what impact is that going to have on our revenue stream? Good question. Yes, uh, so we're working through uh, that at the moment and there's a few uh, little nuances and distinctions with uh, the term rental holidays doesn't mean that the uh, money is written off. It just means it's carried forward so that in the next uh, quarter they pay a little bit more money. And the uh, idea is that there will be a, a sort of catch up uh, of the, any arrears that are uh, uh, sort of achieved. So that, that's different to uh, sort of a rent free. Uh, other, other incentives that have been offered by the council and the government are various um, uh, sort of concessions, especially to the leisure uh, 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 sort of tenants uh, and small businesses who can claim uh, uh, sort of grants. And there's another uh, round of grants that the uh, council are looking at uh, for those who, who apply, who are tenants of, uh, of the council. And Philip might want to sort of expand a little bit more as to how it's treated uh, from an accountancy uh, point of view as well. I've got Daniel wanting to speak. Daniel Cohen. Thank you, um, Chairman. Just just to uh, to clarify as well, the, the rent holiday um, period currently uh, for those tenants were eligible to apply. First and foremost, that's the tenants that were not could not apply if they were in arrears prior to the April quarter or the March um, traditional quarter, uh, but currently those that have been able to apply for the rent holiday, um, it was, uh, and those successfully have applied, it's been applied from the, the April quarter only. Um, we are getting a few tenants requesting um, further rent holiday or, or who haven't requested holiday before going forward. Those individual requests are being with the Executive Director of Finance and Resources. Okay, I think we just caught that. Um, supplementary to that, with, shall I call it, the crisis in the retail sector, uh, have we got tenants coming forward uh, requesting a reduction in rent and renegotiation? Um, yes, uh, numerous discussions are uh, sort of taking place. Uh, the uh, April quarters, uh, the uh, June quarters uh, sort of rent has recently been issued and that's generated an, uh, sort of a number of conversations. Uh, we haven't reached a conclusion on any of those yet and we'll be treating each, each one on its merits. Yeah, I can understand. Councillor Cubitt, speak again. Um, so um, thank you very much for that response. Just um, uh, 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 as a final, in terms of percentages, because you make a very specific reference, uh, Daniel, to those that, that were already in arrears could not request a rent holiday. If we're looking at our um, commercial real estate portfolio in its entirety, what percentage of our commercial real estate portfolio is in arrears, number one, was in arrears on April 1? What percentage of our commercial real estate has got, uh, has made requests for rental holidays? Um, and what percentage uh, of our um, commercial real estate is already in um, delinquent stage, i.e. Um, we're expecting them to go bankrupt? I think what we've got there is probably something requiring a written answer because it's quite a detailed request there, I think, right? but we'll see what uh, Martin has to say. <laughs> yes, it, it, um, it's, it's 
work that is presently underway with the economic welfare support group as well, uh, working with Sue's team, uh, understanding uh, you know, what the issues are, uh, what the trading position of each company uh, is. So that work is uh, sort of ongoing and we can come back to uh, uh, councillor with the uh, uh, more, more detail on that. I appreciate that, Martin. With respect to this paper and this portfolio, yeah. are any of these delinquent? Are any of these have any of these sought rental holidays? Have any of were any of these in arrears? Are all are all these function this investment portfolio specifically? Because I asked that question in in generality regarding the totality of our portfolio, but I'm now asking specifically with regards to the rental revenues um, on the. Um, the um the, the investments we currently got on page 26. Uh, uh daniel wants to speak on that one daniel thank you councillor cubit um what i can say from the, the last summary um i had undertaken was that the the only uh on on the list the only um tenant there was um one of the um units one and two winchester road and it's, uh, one of the two there uh, was the only one that actually could legitimately request a rent holiday. Um, so we, we're currently dealing with that, that one application. That sounds sufficient, I think. Thumbs up from Emily. Right, anything, anybody else want to speak on this? Yes, Graham, Councillor Fulton. Unmute yourself, Graham. Yeah, <clears throat> got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just just following on from Councillor Cubitt's uh, point and the and the discussion there, uh, I don't know whether it's appropriate to raise it now or whatever, but I will. And that that is, I think we're all absolutely and utterly concerned about the current situation on the wider financial situation. I mean, yesterday on the Andrew Marr show, it was stated that. Was it uh, 76 out of 83 councils we will be bankrupt in 18 months time so it's obviously a huge issue all over the place at what point um, be it us cabinet or whoever should be looking at the overall effect that we're likely to be looking at and what it's going to do to our reserves and what we're going to do going forward i.e it's a much bigger issue than the one we're just discussing here the historical report of the property investment strategy. So I don't have an answer for that, but I thought I'd throw it into the pot. Uh, certainly a question for Councillor Goulding, and no doubt Hannah will be getting back to us as soon as she's got a position on it. Uh, Philip, you want to more words, Mr Hood? Uh, thank you, Chair. Just, really just to say that we will be providing a report to Cabinet in September, which will be looking at the current year's budget and uh, looking to review the budget and to look at how what the implications are on the current year of the COVID crisis and how we can fund that. I think that answers that question. Councillor Cubitt again. It's just that Councillor Harvey, I think, has got his hand up and wanted to ask a question. My apologies to Councillor Harvey, please, Paul. Thank you, Adelaide. <laughs> um, just picking up that particular point around where we are and where we're going to be, my concern is the overexposure to the commercial sector. It's the question that Onely, that Graham, that a lot of us have asked on a regular basis in terms of the profile of the, the investment portfolio here particularly, but then obviously broader than that, just in its, in its sense. You're doing a report, Philip. That's going to go to Cabinet in September. Where do we look at this portfolio and how far exposed we are to the crisis purely just for commercial? It's not retail. This is going to be offices. This is going to be commercial. It's going to involve Hounds Mills, Danes Hill, Basingview. All of our major industrial areas are going to be affected by this, much of which we own, much of which we rely on for rental income and so on. And I'm just conscious of a report on our finances is really important, but understanding that environment from your perspective Martin as well and welcome to the council um, is really important where's the joined up thinking going on this and is there actually a group of you working on this together to present a report and can I ask separately in terms of the the portfolio that you're looking to dispose of 
as Anneli says, if this portfolio drops below the number that you're looking for, will you stop disposing those sites, particularly if those sites are giving the council a rental income? Or would we prefer to have the capital assets sold and have a capital return? Or is it better to have the rent? And our ward councillors involved in that disposal, do they know that those business units in their wards are being disposed of? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Harvey. Few uh, few questions uh, there. Uh, we are in discussions with uh, sort of ward councillors on the uh, uh, th uh, um, three properties identified for disposal. Uh, you know, there might be local issues, so we've got to bottom those uh, uh, those matters out first. Um, secondly, um, I'd say in connection with the uh, sort of wider commercial property portfolio. We are out at the moment uh, to tender for some property advisors to look at the portfolio strategy and individual asset management uh, strategies for individual properties, so we can uh, sort of maximise the um, uh, uh, sort of assets for the council uh, there. Um, that that process should uh, we should have them on board by August, uh, hopefully. Uh, we've got a strong list of five uh, sort of uh, uh, well-known firms. Uh, in terms of whether we sell or not, uh, I think it depends on the um, assessment, uh, our own personal assessment as, you know, as, as a council, as to whether we consider that to be sort of a giveaway, uh, giveaway price or um, you know, a fair price for that individual asset. So... Uh, you know, I think those are uh, the three questions, unless I missed anything. Well, a, fa a fair price um, at the time may not necessarily be a price at which we wish to sell. Um, Paul? Yeah, yeah that, that's my point, Roger. I agree. I think that the question becomes one of, does the authority require a rental income? And if we're taking a policy of disposal to acquire capital receipts, that's fine. It's, it's where does the line get drawn on the priority of this council? Is it from a financial perspective? Or is it purely from your own, from a property portfolio perspective? Where does the team bit come in here to say, actually, the council needs revenue over capital, um, particularly on these? I and mean, it may only be that these are 2.49 million. Maybe others that you're thinking of in the longer run. If we set a policy, I'd like to know there is a policy. Or if it's ad hoc, I'd like to know it's ad hoc. It's, it's really good <coughs> really to line on that. For, for the first three properties, they're you know, uh, you know rather small uh, sort of individually. So you know, I think they um, you know, there will will be an assessment of you know what rental they give, what value uh, they could generate, uh, and there will come a point where um, you know, in, in talking to finance and yourselves, that it's not worth uh, worth selling. Uh, the sort of commercial property advice as well will be strengthened by once once we get all advisors on board as well yeah thanks thanks for taylor Thank you, Chair, um, and welcome, uh, Martin. Um, it wouldn't be an audit uh, meeting if I didn't lament the fact that the property uh, investment uh, strategy failed to invest in residential property. And um, I am very pleased to hear that we're going to get some independent uh, advice and part of that will be looking at um, the mix and the, the relevant balance and risk. And I, I personally would be very grateful if that would also consider whether or not our exposure and risks would have been reduced if we had in fact invested in residential property. Um, because I do think that is important. It was something that the, the original council uh, resolution asked us to, to, you know, ask for this strategy to uh, consider proactively and it, it's failed to do that. And I think that it's an important understanding of our mix or um, balance of the kind of investment portfolios we make, especially going up forward, because we must learn from that. Um, and, uh, and finally, I continue to raise my disappointment that um, when we approved the additional five million, um, that actually we spent some of that before we had actually disposed of, of, of the properties rather than actually have the money available. And we've clearly had to take it out of some pot from somewhere, which 
in the current circumstances we may well regret. So really um, it statements more than anything else, but a request that when we look at the, the balance of our portfolio, that we consider whether or not we might have had a different effect had we included residential property. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, I think we actually did consider residential property. It was just that there weren't sufficient uh, revenue generation at the time. And that was very much what we were looking for in terms of the 30 million which was allocated. Council approved the extra 5 million, well aware of the fact that they hadn't made any disposals to plug the gap. It was always going to be something in the future. So um, I think I'm reasonably happy with the way the administration have acted. It is disappointing that we don't have more residential in the mix. I would agree with you there. But hopefully that is something which will come forward in the future. Councillor Harvey. Can I just support Councillor Taylor in what she's saying? I think the argument all along has been the narrowness with which this portfolio looked at residential. It was an incredibly tight brief that was given to the consultants who were brought in specifically to look and in a sense to fail, actually. They were given a hamstrung portfolio to look at um, in terms of residential sites. And I think if we truly are going to look at investment in the future, and this is a lesson to be learned from this because I understood this was closed now. This whole budget area is now closed off. So if it is, and that's why I'm looking for policy going forward, Chair, then I would want to see a much better, much stronger analysis of residential done properly, not with one hand tied behind their back with whoever we bring in so that we could actually achieve something. So I do think Councillor Taylor has a very important point and many of us not across the council have argued this over a long time to broaden our, our exposure um, purely away from just commercial. But I, yeah, I respect that's a broad debate for the council as a whole, not just this committee. Okay, that point is noted. Right, the report is for noting. We're happy to note it. I think we've certainly put, given some comment to carry forward. Okay, that is agenda item six out of the way. Agenda item seven, the Treasury Management Annual Report for 1920, looking very much at um, a long lost world before disaster struck. But um, Mr. Hood, are you um, producing this paper? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, so this, this uh, report provides the uh, committee here with a summary of Treasury, man Treasury management activity during last year, and it attaches a copy as Appendix 1 of the report, draft report to go to uh, Council. Oh. Apologies, I think my video wasn't working there. Can you hear me okay now? I can hear you. Okay, good, thank you. Right. Um, First of all, I'd just like to apologise. There's one correction that needs to be made to the uh, introductory report. So in paragraph 1.4 on page 30, uh, it states that the strategy aimed to achieve a return of 2.65 million. Uh, that's actually incorrect. It was 2.63 million, not 2.65 million. The reports that are, the figures that are in the report that's attached are correct, but that one there has been somehow three's got changed to a five. So against that uh, forecast of 2.63 or that budget of 2.63, the actual income that was achieved was 2.82 million. So that was an extra £190,000 of income that was generated during the year. And that was a return of 1.76% over the entire portfolio, which was a bit better than the 1.72% which was budgeted for. Uh, in the report, particularly if you were to look at paragraph uh, 4.1, it explains about the current market conditions and the impact that COVID-19 had. Uh, obviously, that came at the end of the financial year being in March, but we had a cut in base rates then to 0.1%. Uh, and as you'll see in the chart, which is in chart two at the top of page 35, that was a significant reduction, took it down to all time historic lows. And we also had a significant reduction in financial markets, which included bond markets that the council was investing in. However, because that 
impacts of the crisis came late in the financial year. It didn't have a great impact on the income that the council received. So which is why we actually ended up exceeding slightly the amount of income that we had in the budget. However, there was a, uh, a change in the valuation of the council's uh, investments. So the investment funds uh, had a loss of uh, 4.73 million and that's on page 36 and is shown graphically in table three on page 37. So you can see there the impact that March had and the, the impact that markets had on the council's investment. So we saw this 4.73 reduction in income. That was actually only, a, a, I say only, that was a 5.91% reduction in investment income, uh, which is considerably less than it would, sorry, considerably less than it would have been if the council was invested in more risky shares. We don't have any investments in equities. Um, and as you'll see in the update that's provided, in events since the reporting date in section nine, the council has actually made up about half of that loss in income by the end of May. So there had been a 2.38 million pound improvement in the value of the council's investments funds from the end of March to the end of May. And just finally to say, as explained in the report, because we hold a lot of um, our investments in liquid funds, the, the cash flow implications that the council's had as a result of COVID-19, we've been able to manage without having to go out into the market to borrow. And we don't anticipate having cash flow problems in the future, not in this year anyway. Uh, so the report is for noting by the committee and for um, any additional comments that the committee might want to pass on to council when the report goes there later uh, in July. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Hood. Um, you, you say with cash flow is fine, we can survive, but in terms of revenue, this is going to have a, a definite impact on the funds available for resident services next year. Uh, what work is being done on that at the moment? Yes, you're quite correct. As I said, the, the impact of the crisis was relatively low on last year's investment income because it was only one month that it impacted on. Whereas in 2020-21, we're seeing the full impact probably for the whole year and beyond that. Uh, we have been revising our forecasts of uh, investment income. We've been also revising our forecasts of other income that we're getting across the council, because obviously that's been impacted by services being um, closed at certain car parks, those sorts of things. Uh, so we are doing this report I mentioned earlier, which will be going to cabinet in July, which will set out all the implications and our the changes to the forecast and the budgets that are needed we think to take account of what's been going on with COVID-19. Councillor Harvey you were indicating wanted to speak. You and asked my question really thank you chair but just also to add to that and say thank you to Philip because I'm not sure whether this would be your your last meeting or not Philip but a huge thank you for all your effort and support and over the years I think you've you, you know, this report shows how well you've managed the finances with your team, and it's a huge, huge thank you. I'm afraid this probably is Philip's uh, last meeting, as uh, he's due to leave in July, and uh, we don't meet again till September. Councillor Burke. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm not quite sure what the regulators look at when they look at our financial management, but I was just interested really in table six, which is on page 42, where um, it talks about a prudential um, indicator of minus 11 and an actual of, of nine. And I wondered if that kind of swing, I know it's going to be happening to a lot of councils, but is that kind of um, swing something that will uh, throw up a question in our regulators at all? Is Mr. Hood was still with us? I am, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Trying to read um, what was in paragraph 12.6, just to explain, I know they're quite complex, some of these, these prudential indicators. Um, I think uh, certainly looking at the um, risk indicators, the interest risk indicator, which was originally set at 0.5, 
was probably a bit unrealistic when we actually ran the numbers that came out at 0 0.9. So I think that's one that needs changing in the future. Yes, that, that particular one that was 0 point, went from 0 0.5 to 0 0.9 was basically because during the year we had some fixed term investments which matured. Uh, we might originally have planned to replace those with other fixed term investments, but because of what was happening with interest rates being very low and long term rates being very low, they were put into uh, more variable rate uh, investments, such as some of the bond funds that we have, which meant then that we are more exposed to increases or more affected by increases in interest rates. So it's when we set those um, strategy indicators, it's trying, it's very difficult to anticipate exactly what's going to happen during the year. Uh, but as it happened, we ended up with less money in fixed rate investments than we had at the start of it. Thank you. Uh, but if I, on that other question that the council was asking about the proportion of financing cost of a net revenue stream, if you could allow me just to have a look at that. I can do a written response because I, I can't get my, can't be, I can't be clear at the moment what the reason is for that minus 11 to plus nine. Okay, Councillor Kiewicz. Thank you. Um, uh, no, um, if I could um, echo um, the sentiments of um, other councillors um, and say to Philip that um, it's been wonderful working with you over the many years that we have and you've been amazing and very sad that you're leaving. Um, just uh, on page 44, um, this is another topic that I raise regularly and I just love you to uh, advise us of the uh, quality of our short term investments to other borough councils, because as um, uh, Councillor Faulkner has already, already made reference, there is uh, numerous uh, um, uh, uh, mentions in, 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 in newspapers at the moment that many councils are suffering financially, and these are short term ones. Um, are they um, uh, effectively underwritten by the government? Can I answer that, Chair? Yes, please, Philip. <laughs> Sorry, um, no, they are, they're not underwritten by the government. They are effectively on behalf of that council. Um, the only way it would be to go to the government was if the council was to go bust and then the, count, the government was to uh, step in. But I don't, I don't think that's going to happen because we know that councils have got uh, the support of taxpayers and so on behind them. So they're not underwritten by the government, they are loans from the councils. No councils have ever gone bust. Uh, some of, one of them has had a, uh, a, a warning that it's issued and had to take special measures, but none have gone bust. Uh, and as you can see, the dates for those, those loans are very short term. So the, they're up, the last of them comes back on the 20th of August, 2020. So they're not long-term loans, they're short-term loans, which are, but I'm, we're paying us an even better now, better rates of interest, 0.9% interest. Um, so, and they run for maybe six months, it varies depending on the loan, but they're all coming back at the end of August. Philip, can you just confirm that the first three of those, which have got maturity dates, which have expired, have all come in? Yes, they've all come in, yes. I hope that answers uh, some of our honest worry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and um, just so um, we've got no concerns with the. Uh, we didn't. Re did we renew them? Did we re-extend them? Did we roll them over, or did we actually take receipt? Was there a clear the cash would have come back as a, sorry? It would have come back as a receipt. And we haven't extended that facility. Uh, we may have lent. We now have to look at what we've got now. We may have lent new money out. So this is a snapshot of loans that were outstanding at the thirty-first of March. There would be other loans that will be outstanding now. Um, to other different councils, um, but they'll be short term. Our policy is only to lend to other councils for short term. So um, I, I, I understand that. Just, but um, in terms of who does the credit risk evaluation on these boroughs, because um, if 70% of all borough councils are in financial difficulty at the moment, um, and we've taken receipt of monies from Nosley or Blynow or Fair and or Fairham, and then we've extended it to A and other borough councils. How do we choose which A and other borough councils we're extending it to and who does the evaluation on their balance sheet? Uh, we use Arling Close as a treasury management advisor. So if they had any concerns about a particular counterparty, then they would advise us of that. 
but they do have the same the view that all local councils have got the same uh, protections in terms of their being public sector organisations and then be able to raise money from council tax. So they don't believe that for short term loans, we need to treat them differently. If it was for a longer term loan, then we would be looking more at their balance sheet and the assets they, they have. I think Onley might have a point about the liquidity position of some of these councils rather than their, their long term solvency. Um, but as we've seen, the, the, the three that have fallen due have been repaid. Hmm. And at the moment, certainly, I can't see any reason to suspect that the others won't be. No. But it, it is, as you say, a worry in terms of uh, the liquidity of these councils. Only, do you want to speak? <laughs> You're still muted on okay. Sorry. If I could just say one last thing um, for you, the chair, possibly, and Sue, if she could come back on this. I mean, in the finance world, um, with certain countries that we used to lend money to, we'd have these, we call them short term, but they were evergreen facilities. And uh, whilst they were short term, they weren't really short term because they were in out. And um, I, I, I hear what Philip's saying and I hear what Arlene Close is saying. And it was a bit tongue in cheek when I said, is it underwritten by the government? Because that's how um, ultimately if 70% of these councils are financially strained at the moment. Um, but I would just like, um, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, for us as a committee to be aware that if you renew short term facilities every year, they are they're deemed as evergreen. They are ostensibly long term facilities if they're always to the same counterparty. Uh, Philip, perhaps you could comment on that. But typically these are cash flow um, loans. We have surplus funds available. Councils need a short term funding and it's in and out usually for six months and they aren't rolled over it's usually going to be a fresh loan to a different council when the money is reinvested yes absolutely so these are it's not a credit facility that we set up with each council we agree each loan separately and then they're repaid at the date of maturity and then the council decides it may want the money back because we need it to fund some expenditure or we may have additional money we want to invest and that may be with another council or it may be with another counterparty that's on our investment um, list. So it, it isn't a, um, a rolling loan to one council. I think we can uh, get away from Councillor Cousins usual complaint is which we're lending money to other councils so that they can build council houses. <laughs> that is not the case with these, these loans. Right. Anybody else on to speak on this paper or can we note it? Councillor Harvey. Well, just quickly, in terms of an action chair, I mean, if we're saying next year that many local authorities are potentially going to be in financial trouble and we're continuing with this policy, then is the policy right in the sense that some of those councils may well find themselves unable to repay the loans? And if that's the case, is there, is there, is there actually an argument for saying the policy itself just needs to be examined? If I'm in close to a general policy that all of local government is safe to invest in because they don't see public bodies as falling over, therefore they don't give them a risk rating in the way you might do in a normal set of circumstances, then surely perhaps we just ourselves need to look at this and say we are comfortable with it as a policy? I think that's one I'll bounce back on to Philip. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, that we do an annual review of the Treasury management policy. So that's absolutely something that we will pick up. We'll look at not only local authorities, but any other counterparties that we have. Banks, as you say, whether they're in this country or abroad, uh, the strength of those and any other institutions that we may invest money with. I think that's probably one worth flagging up with um, Councillor Golding, that uh, it is a concern of the committee that short term loans to cash strapped local authorities at this time is a policy that needs looking at. Okay, Ellie? Yep, that's noted. Right, note the report. Okay, right, at this point, EU audit planning report for year ending. We have Maria Grindley and Larissa Mildoni joining us and they will give us a rundown on where we are with the audit. Thank you, Chair. Um, councillors, um, 
the first thing really to say is that the audit plan that's in your papers, item eight on page 45, um, was drafted um, in early March, as you'll see from the date on the plan. Um, so what I really want to do, I know that you'll have read the papers, what I know, really want to do today is to hand over to Larissa in a moment just to talk you through the changes to the plan as a result of COVID-19 and the implications. Um, I think that's probably the most important thing that we that we bring to this meeting today. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, those of you who have um, been through this process for a while will understand that we undertake all our NHS audits and then we go into local government, which is what we're doing now. Um, we've just completed our NHS audits, so we had quite a bit of learning from those on COVID-19. So I guess I just want to share a couple of things with you as, a, as an overall that I think might be of use for you to um, to know just from, from that process. Firstly, um, we tried to hold all our audits to the original deadlines that we had. Um, and whilst we were able to do that with the remote working, there were some things that just took longer. And I kind of call it stuck in the mud time. So stuff that just takes a little bit longer because the auditor can't stand next to the person, look through the spreadsheets on the desk and get clear explanations as to what's happening. So that was probably the first implication for us. Um, the second implication is there are some areas of the audit plan where we've had to do different work or um, where the, uh, the work we're doing is changing. And um, Larissa will be able to talk you through that. And then the third point is one that's very much on the on the um, mind of the council and, and this committee, as I've just heard, which is around that point around going concern and how we um, kick the tyres heavily on going concern. And that's to the, the points that you've already raised around not only looking at reserves and um, financial position, but also considering liquidity of organisations. And what we've just found from the NHS um, round is that we, um, at the end of the audit, have to go in through a very clear process of consultation to consider um, the going concern of organisations. Because ultimately, when I sign the audit report on your statements, I'm signing to say that from 12 months of, away from my signature, 12 months on from my signature, um, the council's going concern assessment is absolutely right and, and I'm content with it. So that's why that's the third part of the, the work that we're focusing more on as, as, as a result of um, COVID-19. So I just wanted to set that context um, because clearly that's not in the plan, but we've just been through quite a bit of learning on the NHS accounts and I thought it would be um, important that I shared that with you now. Now, just ask Larissa to take you through the key changes um, that have taken place as a result um, of COVID-19 with regards to our audit approach and plan. Okay, before Larissa comes in, uh, my concerns tend to be on property valuations, uh, the pension scheme deficit, and the level at which you are reporting to the committee. Uh, I know you have something like 100,000 as um, an un unadjusted uh, item figure. We've always worked on 50,000 in the past. We're not asking you to find more, we're just asking you to report more. Welcome, Larissa. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Maria already mentioned, I'm going to walk you through the main points in our uh, audit planning report, and I will emphasize those areas where uh, we expect changes due to COVID-19. So to start with, I'd like to take you to page five of our report, which is page 49 of the papers. And as I walk you through the main risks that we identified, I will emphasize those areas that we, we do expect a change. Uh, starting with the, the first risk is uh, around inappropriate capitalization of revenue expenditure, which is also mentioned earlier. And we, we don't expect a change in this area. It is consistent to prior year and it, it is a requirement that we're fulfilling in accordance with uh, international standards so on auditing 240. Uh, the next risk is um, around valuation of um, land and buildings, which has been extensively discussed so far at this meeting. And we have upgraded the risk from inherent to significant compared to prior year, even before COVID-19, due to the change in the process 
um, uh, the, the process for valuation was brought forward and two different valuers are involved, which from our perspective increases the risk of um, misstatements as of the reporting date. Um, and uh, in response to COVID-19, we also expect certain changes in the nature and extent of our procedures because of the uncertainties around uh, valuation. Uh, moving on to the third risk, uh, we have IFRS 16 in the report, which um, has been delayed for local government to 21-22 uh, financial year. And it's not no longer an area of focus this year. We expect it in the next year's report. Um, but instead, the, the area of focus, as Maria already mentioned, is around COVID-19 disclosures in the accounts. Um, and that a further impact on our audit in terms of how we process the information produced by the entity and how we uh, consult in order to issue our audit report. Moving on to the next page. Sorry, uh, the, the last any comment yep. on the pension liability valuation. That's coming up next on the next page. Next I'll slide. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, uh, as usual, we have our uh, evaluation of pension liability as, um, um, as an inherent risk in our uh, audit plan. And uh, so far, we, we have not um, identified and attached a, a specific COVID-19 um, risk around this one. Uh, however, it's still being assessed. And then moving on, on the same page, we have uh, laid out our uh, materiality thresholds for planning purposes. These are calculated based on the prior year audited figures. Uh, they're only used for planning purposes and we will be updating our thresholds as we get the draft accounts. Uh, the basis and the, um, the range in that basis has not changed compared to prior year. Um, and the, the, the point about the 50,000 um, has not been reflected in, in this audit plan. Could it be? Sorry? Uh, could it be? Uh, the, the question was, could it be? So um, what, we, what we can do as part of our audit is if we find anything at that level, um, we can include it in. It's not normal practice at all. We're only required to um, report above SAD. So we are not giving you any assurance as members when we do that, that there aren't other things in there. We only work to those levels of materiality. So that's why we don't tend to report. It's very unusual here that it's been done in the past. Um, obviously, we I've picked up this order. several years now. We've no, I, I understand. Moment. I understand it's been done here before, but that's very unusual. It's not the norm across the piece at all. Um, and in doing so, it raises the risk that someone reading our report um, and thinks or forms a judgment that we've audited to that level, which we won't have done. So if we find anything lower, we can include it. But clearly what we will do is ensure that there's a very clear marker in our report that says we've not audited to that level. All we're saying is, if you find something at that level, please report it. We're not asking you to do any additional work. I understand. Um, what I'm saying is, in the report, um, I don't want anyone else picking it up who's not heard that to think that we have audited to that level. So I'll just make sure that's really clear in our report. I'm happy with that. Is it, are, are the committee happy with that comment? Fine. <laughs> okay, Larissa, can you continue? <laughs> Uh, yes, sure. So I'd like to jump to page uh, 26 of our report, which is uh, page 70 in the papers, just to emphasize another change uh, compared to the plan. We, we have changed the, the timeline. Uh, according to this plan, we're supposed to start the year end procedures at the beginning of June and uh, in communication and agreement with the Council, we're starting um, next week. So that will move the date of our reporting, which um, has also moved for the 
um, for the local government uh, entities to end of November. Um, and we, we expect to substantially complete our procedures uh, to the end of August. However, we are aware that we um, will have probably some difficulties in access uh, to information. And we're in close collaboration with the council's management on how we can address that challenge. Uh, these are the main points I wanted to emphasize. Um, we'll open up for questions um, and I'll hand it back to Maria to wrap up. Okay, questions? We don't appear to have any. <laughs> so we're, we're happy with the report as presented um, with just that uh, change to the reporting level. Certainly in the past, it's usually been a, a fact that you haven't actually found anything. So, <laughs> sorry, I've got uh, Councillor Cubitt here. Yes, sorry. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, actually, my question was in relation to the letter that um, we received from um, Ernst & Young to you and uh, which you replied to them on the 26th of May. Um, firstly, um, is, is this a standard um, letter that... Uh, it is the next item on the agenda, Henri. Is it? Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. I thought it was part of this paper. No, it's the next paper. Okay, apologies. Right, anything further? Then, Maria, it's uh, down to you now to wrap up. Um, so it was just to say, um, clearly the audit um, was pushed back um, on request of your officers because of COVID-19. Um, so what we um, have managed to do is, is secure the audit resource and, and uh, move the audit back. Um, so that, that was basically all agreed at the time. We will um, bring to your next meeting now the audit results report in September. Um, and give you an update at that stage as to our findings. Um, in regards to the point about whether they'd found anything below um, or above 50,000 in previous audits, um, speaking to my colleague, they basically only pulled out anything that, that struck them. Um, so as we go through the audit, people will test various things at different levels and they only really pull out anything above our, our usual SAD limits unless there's a particular issue or point below that. And that's the sort of thing that will be included in your report. So I'm more than comfortable to do that, but it may be that they did in the past identify smaller items, but they just weren't of significance to include um, at that 50,000 pound, just because of the nature of them as such in the in the detailed testing. So I just wanted to clarify that point. Just as um, a if you do find something between 50 and 100,000, then we would like to be aware of it. Of course, of course. Yeah, I fully understand, fully understand. Um, and then it was just to say, I will obviously keep you updated because um, I've heard the committee's concern around going concern and how that's playing out across the sector. So when we come to the next meeting, I'll be able to give you more of a wider update as to what's happening across the piece as well um, with other organisations, which I think will probably be of more use to you than maybe if I just focus on our report and our findings. So I'll try and well, ensure that we do that at the that next one, meeting. That's going to be of interest to one of hmm. uh, One last question. Uh, what is all this going to have as an effect on the fee? So the fee at the moment is under consideration. There's two points with regards to the fee. Um, any additional work that we have to undertake for significant risks is in addition to the PSAA contracted fee and anything that's in addition will go through PSAA. Um, so we have to get PSAA sign off on any additional fee but certainly any additional work that we have to undertake. So that will be anything around additional um, experts being used on things like property planting equipment, um, any additional work or additional time that it takes because of the inefficiency of COVID or any additional work because of the additional risks around going concern um, will all be uh, resulting in additional fee. But all of that gets discussed in detail with your officers first. It then goes through PSAA for challenge because our contract is with PSAA, not with the council. Um, and then obviously I ensure that you are fully cited of that as well as those charged with governance. And I provide a detail to you as to the, the actual additional fees and, and how they've incurred. Um, 
The other point, if I may, Chair, is just to update you on what's happening more centrally on fees with PSAA. And that is that um, the firms are all in discussion with PSAA about the level of local government fees. Those of you who have been doing this for um, uh, a number of years will know that our fees have constantly reduced. Um, you'll have seen the impacts on the sector last year um, uh, and the impacts on the delivery last year and timing um, across the piece, um, where 40% of local government audits by all firms were not delivered by the um, September deadline. Uh, well, certainly not by the July deadline um, and then not by the September deadline. And um, so we are in discussion with PSA on those fees. But that's a future point, not a current year fee point. But as I'm aware of it, I wanted to make you aware as you'd raise a question on fees. I must admit, I've always been surprised by the way the fee has come down and its impact on the, the level of audits that can be carried out within that, that fee. But um, although you've talked about the, the process, in terms of the fee increase. What's your feeling in terms of our audit and the additional work that's been required so far? So we do have additional work with regards to your audit. We do have additional work on um, property plant and equipment. We are engaging our specialists there. Um, we have got um, uh, valuers that are currently putting in material uncertainty in the valuations because of all the points that you've rehearsed earlier in this committee um, around the difficulty around valuation because of COVID-19. That doesn't necessarily result in a modified audit report for you. It depends on the nature of your assets and where we think the risk might lie. So that's something that we need to work through yet. Um, and depending on the amount of work that's required will then um, depend on the the fee coming out of that process. So at this stage, it's too early really to give you an indication, but there will be implications for your fee, which is why there's a TBD or a to be determined in our plan against fee. That I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Larissa as well for her contribution. Thank you. All right, uh, note the report. I'll take that as being noted. Okay, moving on. Well, it has referred to the letter from Ernst & Young, which we get every year. It's usually the same questions, and it's invariably the same answers. Uh, Philip does draft it for me, and I go through it and make one or two changes, where I think perhaps the standard reply is a bit bland. Um, but when we look at it, I have drafted an interim reply um two things on there one is the committee aware of any actual suspected or alleged frauds uh next report is scheduled for the 29th of june meeting uh which is today so we have that report to come and on question six is the committee aware of actual or potential litigation or claims and that final sentence at this time we are not aware of any I have had confirmation that we're still not aware of any, so that hasn't changed. So I'll take questions on that. Only you had something you wanted to say. Councillor Kibbit. Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, yes, it was about question six, our answer to uh, Ernst and Young regarding six and our answer regarding eight. Um, and um, uh, I um, may be out of date because I thought there was some more, um, I thought there was some more claims that had arisen regarding the leisure park. Am I, am, am I, am I wrong? Am I out of date? I think that is one for Anne Greaves. Anne? Um. Thank you, Chair. Um, there are no specific new claims regarding the leisure park. The litigation, both the um, state aid element and the procurement issue have recently just been concluded. In fact, the agreement was signed last week. Okay, brilliant. And then um, are, there, are there no issues in relation to Basing View at the moment with regards to the partner there as well? No. Okay, so there are no claims outstanding of any size whatsoever, as uh, confirmed by uh, the chairman. 
That's correct. Brilliant. So now question number eight, thank you for that, Anne. Question number eight, um, I'm a bit more problematic, um, uh, is uh, about the related parties, um, Mr. Chairman, um, because there is a, um, um, I'm not sure, I'm, I mean, I, I feel that we should make reference to the Leisure Park partner and Muse in addition to Many Down. Um, and I don't know whether the Many Down um, uh, partnership agreement's been signed yet with Welcome and Urban Trust. And these are really significant, as we all know, um, financial uh, projects uh, representing, I think, underlying value of £6 billion. Um, and I just wondered whether we ought to say more about the uh, current position with regards to those three partners. Uh, Mr Hood, can you comment on that? Um, I can make a few comments there. So uh, we haven't signed the agreement yet with um, Welcome Trust and Urban Civic. So that's, I think, answers that question. Um, I think the, the issue around the uh, related parties is that they have to have a significant influence over the council. So that means that they have to be able to vote and you know, influence the council's decisions, which I don't think I mean, some, sometimes, so I don't think the organisations we're talking about have got that. Um, I don't know if Anne might, may be able to help a bit further, but um, that's my understanding. And yeah, I think uh, the agreements under discussion are um, the development agreements, so contractual arrangements rather than um, interests in which um, the developer has got a 50% or more interest. Um, so they are just pure contractual things. How does that differ from Many Down? And Many Down is um, a limited liability partnership um, where the two councils have combined to form Topco and then they've entered into an arrangement with um, the developer to develop out Many Down. It, it's not a development agreement in the traditional sense, a development agreement in the traditional sense, such as um, the one with New River is um, a, it's a contractual arrangement whereby a party agrees to do something, i.e. develop the leisure park um, in exchange for certain rights and it's enforced by, by contract. There's no, um, it's a different arrangement for sharing of uh, risk and reward, I think is the way I'd say it. I understand that. On later, you? Yes, you sorry. So, so I'm, um, so I have made an error uh, in understanding what related parties means, um, so that therefore New River and Muse should not appear there, um, is my understanding of what you've just said. Um, so I have a supplementary, which is firstly, if somebody could explain to me when Many Down is going to sign with Urban and Civic and um, uh, um, Welcome Trust, because I, I thought it, it, it had happened or was about to happen. And I'd love somebody just very briefly to say what, what's what's holding up, what, what, when when's the when's the projected date of signing of that. Secondly, in terms of, and this is much more important, and I'd maybe like to hear from Ernst and Young. Um, uh, given the underlying value of um, the leisure park and Basing View is significant, and given that we're talking about three projects which are worth six billion pounds, not not million, billion. Is there somewhere on this letter that should take into account these huge development projects if they don't fall under the query reference question eight? So there's two questions. Okay, uh, can I pass that over to, well, firstly, I'll ask Maria, Maria Grindley, but then I'll have a word with Councillor Robinson from uh, a DC perspective. Um, thank you. Yes, I, I fully understand the, the base of the question. The um, reason they are not picked up in this letter is because um, this letter is pretty much driven by the standards based on what's currently happening. However, 
um, as part of our planning, our continuous planning and our work through the year, we have these absolutely in our sites and will be and have continued to discuss them with officers as we have our catch up. So we will make sure um, that as they um, fall within our remit, when they as they start to impact on the financial statements, financial position of the organisation under our value for money conclusion, that we are um, assessing and looking at these matters. Um, but this letter is purely driven by, um, which is why it is, um, to the chairman's point, um, quite standard each year. It's purely driven by the um, auditing standards and the standard um, questions that we need to ask you as those charged with governance. Are you happy with the answers you're getting? Um, I am indeed at this point, yes. If, if I wasn't, I would be raising um, audit points to that effect. But also, I must say that um, Philip and his team are very much um, open with us and they do raise things with us in advance. Um, so I would be more unhappy if there were things being raised now that I wasn't aware of, um, but that's not the case. So um, thank you very much, um, Maria. Mr. Chairman, would you indulge me just, just to ask a secondary? I mean, do you think that in view of, I mean, because you know our borough is a very unusual borough and we're not talking about run of the mill activities that we should possibly have um, an addendum to this question which is asked every year, which is about these contracts, these huge contracts and the performance they're under. Because one of the problems with the council uh, in the time that I've been a councillor is that we do seem to have problems with um, uh, uh, the contracts, uh, the contractors on these huge projects being fulfilled by the partnerships that we've signed partnership agreements with and specifically them meeting their KPIs and specifically things that the council has to do in order to enable them to, to state that they have met their KPIs. I think this is something for the letter of representation and um, discussions at uh, a cabinet level rather than for us. Um, Councillor Robinson, you wanted to come in on many down? Well, uh, sorry, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, sorry, but just before we talk about- um, oh, um, Sorry, Anneli, I'm, I'm calling Councillor Robinson in. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, the situation with Wellcome Trust and Urban and Civic, um, we were on the point of signing with them and everything went into lockdown. We're expecting to sign up with them, for, you know, final signatures within the next two weeks or so. Um, there's uh, an update paper which I cleared with Philip at the Many Down team. I cleared that over the weekend. That's going out to all the mock members. Um, I'm happy to forward that to... Uh, Councillor Cubitt, there's, uh, there's nothing in there that's sensitive, but I'll, I'll forward it to her so she's fully up to date. And if anybody else wants a copy of it, I'll just, just ask me. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Cubitt, can, sorry, you can continue now. It, it, I just, it was just finally to um, uh, ask Maria whether, the, whether, whether we should be made aware of uh, performances under these huge contracts and whether she's aware of these performances under these huge contracts or failure to perform? So um, in response to the first question, um, one of the things we don't do is, is um, set policy or set how organisations should structure or update their various committees. So it wouldn't be right for me to um, impose a view on that. Um, from the point of view of the audit committee, the role of the audit committee is to gain assurance that the processes and structures and procedures are running. Um, you get that assurance, some of that assurance from us as external audit, you get assurance from a number of other places. So it's for you as a committee and for you as those charged with governance to determine whether you are getting the assurance you need and to work with officers to ensure that you are doing so. That's not something that I would um, comment on. Um, from the point of view of the contract, as part of our value for money conclusion, we clearly do consider um, one of the aspects of that is working with partners and we consider um, large contracts, large um, arrangements that organisations have with partners. And that's really where a review of this would come into play. Um, the only way it would come into play on the audit opinion is if we felt that there was misappropriation of assets or um, misreporting of the financial position as a result of this contract or contract management issues. Um, so it would either come in there at the opinion or it would come in under our value for money conclusion if we felt that there were improvements to be made in the way that you were working with your partners. 
Okay, can we, uh, Councillor Harvey? Well, that does raise the point about oversight and it needs to go somewhere. Nick's the chair of Many Down Oversight Committee, which we have, which is clearly overseen Many Down over many years. And I appreciate what he said about where it's going and, and what's coming. Basing view is a different matter entirely. The Basing view members advisory panel meets hardly ever. There is very intermittent information passed on to ward councillors. We receive a PowerPoint presentation that doesn't really go into detail on Muse or our partnership with Muse. It's an executive level area really where the cabinet member and cabinet deal with it themselves. So in terms of oversight of Bayesian View and the amount of money that we as a council have spent specifically on Bayesian View because of our relationship with Muse over the recent years, I would raise a, a small question to say, actually, is the oversight function of that amount of money set against the level of the project appropriate? And is a map an appropriate level of governance for that? Um, it's purely in the gift of the cabinet member. It isn't an oversight function. It doesn't report scrutiny. So I don't see where the oversight function sits in that regard, but I'm conscious we spent some millions of taxpayers' money on raising view, and views had obligations associated with their relationship with us that have given some members cause for concern over the years. So yeah, I mean, I don't know where he goes, Chair, but I think it's an important point that's been raised that needs to be answered by somebody. Well, well, based, based on what you're saying, I would have thought it was something that perhaps scrutiny ought to look at. And there's nothing, no reason why they can't put it on their work program. That's, a very point. That's why it's not there. Chair, would you be willing to make a reference as chair of this committee to scrutiny of that fact? I think that would be really, really helpful. What I'm prepared to do is make a, a note on our minutes that um, the committee probably consider that there may be reason for scrutiny to look at it, and perhaps a chair of scrutiny could consider it. Happy with that? Councillor Taylor. Uh, thank you, Chair. I mean, just picking up a little bit uh, more on um, what Councillor Harvey and, and Councillor Cubitt are saying, it, it's a bit sort of one step more than that. And, and, and I'm not clear in my own mind what the governance arrangements are for these big projects. And as has just been pointed out to us, it's up to us to be assured that we are happy with the arrangements. And since I'm not sure what the arrangements are uh, for oversight of, of, of big, pro big projects like the ones that have been mentioned in the leisure park, should we not have some sort of report to us to tell us what those oversight arrangements are so that we can be satisfied or be assured that there are oversight arrangements and that we are happy with them? I'm not sure that that is part of the terms of reference of the committee. Um, I think it's well worth something that you might want to raise through your group leader and refer it back to the group leaders meeting for them to decide whether or not the scrutiny is adequate. But I don't think it's necessarily down to us. Councillor Harvey? With all due respect, Chair, the, the, the group leaders meeting is an informal meeting of the group leaders. It isn't a formal meeting of this council. It isn't actually a committed meeting of the council. I, I am, I'm not suggesting that the group leaders that, that, that. make that decision, but they should consider whether that decision needs to be made and where it should be made. They are certainly in a position to do something about that, even if they only do it individually. But in any councillor can make a reference th to scrutiny. And that may well be the, the route to take. So what's the standard we should be happy with, Chair? Maybe the, the, the institution can help us. Is there a particular standard or a particular set of um, guidance that we need to be comfortable with as this committee in signing? Well, we need to read the constitution, Paul. <laughs> well, that is the, the document the that the running of the council. Brother Roger, I don't mean the constitution, I mean the set of guidance that Ernst Jung would expect us to have gone through. Uh, I'm not in a position to answer that question. Uh, I think this is something that if you're concerned enough about it, which you obviously are, then refer it to scrutiny and get them to come back. 
Okay, I'm going to move on to the next paper because I think we've, we've strayed off the subject. Um, well, thanks again to uh, Larissa and Maria. Um, but we are now on the annual governance statement, uh, which are papers 10 and 11. And looking at it, the responsibilities of the committee are set out in paragraphs 2, 3, 3, 2, paragraph 4, paragraph 5, and internal audit have done a review on pages 239 to 241. So we are here to approve the draft annual governance statement, and I will take a comment. Um, but who, uh, Anne, are you presenting this one? Uh, yes, Chair, this is my paper. It's all um, yours. Thank you. Um, so the annual governance statement is um, the council's review of its governance arrangements and it comes before you each year and it's a key source of assurance for this committee. Um, it's undertaken by um, a group of officers which form the stewardship team and we've all got a function in relation to um, governance. Um, I think probably the um, most important part of the statement to look at is um, at the end of uh, paragraph five, which has um, the significant governance issues for the forthcoming year. The actual annual government statement itself has taken account of the governance issues for last year and the text of that statement updates on those governance issues. So um, if they don't appear a second time, you can be assured that they, they are dealt with in the text. Um, some do appear for a second time, for instance, the constitutional review um, was there last year and it is still there this year. Um, and um, that is a significant piece of work that will need to be done between now and uh, May um, before the elections. And in fact, going back to the last item, it might be that um, the governance review can deal with some of these issues around the, the major projects and the governance of those at that time. So um, basically the statement sets out um, the government's arrangements um, it sets out how um, there are measures of internal control, how you can have insurance, and um, it identifies those significant governance issues. Happy to take any questions. Okay, any questions? Nobody's indicating that they want to raise anything. I think... The, the one spelling error which was picked up, yes. thank you Jenny, on page 109, which is over fifth line down, complaint should read compliance. <laughs> Both right, I went through it with a fine tooth comb and missed that one. <laughs> I'm very grateful for that. But I think we are happy to approve that statement. Thumbs up please. Thank you. So that is paper 10, item 10, and item 11, the local code of corporate governance, uh, which is also for approval. And Anne, I take it that's you again. It is. Um, the code really doesn't change um, every year. It's exactly the same as it was last year, last reviewed in 2012. But what we do as part of our annual governance review is um, we go through each of the principles um, from the uh, framework and they're set out in the paper at 3.6. And um, if you look at um, the end of the actual code, there is a, an appendix which basically evidences all the documents that we have to show that we're complying with each of those six principles. So it hasn't changed from last year, um, but it has been updated to include new documents as they come forward, such as the uh, new council plan. Um, so, you know, we'll roll forward every year with us adding new documents that evidence that we're complying with the principles of the framework. Yeah, I did have a query on page 116, paragraph 2.2, where it says that um, the document has been revised to reflect the latest guidance of April 2016. In fact, it was revised back in 2017. So that um, sentence might be better just to say it reflects the latest guidance from 2016, rather than the fact that um, a previous document had been revised. 
but that is just me being pedantic. Any other questions? Yes, Councillor Kiewit. Um, it's not a question, Anne, it's more to you, Mr Chairman, and it's reference page 129, and also to Councillor Harvey and Councillor Taylor. Um, with regard to the conversation we had earlier, um, reference our relationships with these very significant, huge development agreements and partnerships. And just that principle four is a very good, useful um, uh, uh, sheet on which um, scrutiny could uh, use as its benchmark to check that all is well and all is well with regards to how those two very significant, if not three significant development agreements are, 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 are working. Is anybody here on scrutiny? Right, uh, I'll pass this one to Graham. Graham, performance panel, just how much detail does it go in, into on these uh, projects? Mm. Uh, that's that's a, a, a good question because I came off performance panel in the last year, having been on it for about four years, and I'm currently vice chairman of scrutiny. I mean, one of my slight bugbears is um, the performance panel, which is only, should we say, a subcommittee, looks at some incredibly important issues. And I just don't think it gets enough uh, daylight actually at the main scrutiny meeting. Um, I, I, I actually think some of the issues should be elevated to full scrutiny, not um, uh, subsumed to a subcommittee where you get a one page report and a sort of two minute overview and, and off we go. So, um, uh, in some, in some ways, and I've also said that some of the issues of performance that are considered, especially to do with finance, I don't quite understand why they're in performance as opposed to audit and accounts, but those are sort of constitutional issues. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's always worth feeding things back to scrutiny to see if they can pick these up. Councillor Taylor, do you want to add anything to that? No. Nope. Uh, yeah, I, I think basically from what is being said, comment we should make is probably that performance panel should put um, scrutiny, should spend more time looking at this area than they currently do. Would you agree, Honorly? It, it, I mean, it was Councillor Harvey that suggested it. I, I just, I, I mean, I just think that these huge um, contracts, um, um, as, as mentioned by you and Councillor Taylor and Councillor Harvey, don't seem to be swept up in an oversight committee. Um, and um, I mean, who discusses the KPIs uh, that have been missed? by a and other contractor or not of these large projects. I don't, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I'm on development control, um, I'm on um, performance committee, but I don't, I don't recall, but I've not been on it for long. I used to be on it about 12 years ago. Um, and I, at that time, I don't think the performance panel fed into scrutiny funnily enough. I think that it got moved because it used to be part of audit. Um, if my memory's right, it might be failing me. Um, so I was on performance panel years ago, I'm back on it now, and I, I don't recall in the last one that I attended, it was all about waste contracts. I don't think we touched on, on, on Basing View or, 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 or the Leisure Centre, but I, I think they're such big projects that uh, I don't think they should go to performance panel. I agree with Councillor Faulkner, they should uh, see the light of day and, and, and if they are to be uh, evaluated, they, they should be done in a proper uh, 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 overview and scrutiny committee. Councillor Harvey. No, I agree. I think performance panel has a very specific role and I think it's right to say where did it fit because it fell out of, any, of the committee system into being a, a, a unit of its own and it was put back under scrutiny. The question begs, you know, if it's looking at KPIs, they are set by the cabinet, they're set by officers in regard to performance, 
that's what it examines. What we're talking about here, I think, is something different, which is what the Many Down Committee was set up to do, to oversee a major project of this authority by having a proper oversight committee, constitutionally established, that could have proper examination. So it isn't just something that's an agenda item on the scrutiny committee, but it had oversight. Scrutiny was meant to be retrospective, looking back at what things may or may not have been done wrong or how we can make them better. Policy committees were meant to be forward looking and bringing the cabinet forward, you know, whatever policies they wanted to bring to us. What there was missing was oversight of the existing things going on in the council at the moment in time. And I think that's where many down had the overview committee because it managed to get hold of that issue. Now, whether there's an argument to say that this council needs a major projects committee, and I know other councillors have discussed that, I'm not the first person to mention that, is there some sort of review of the constitution that could achieve that? Meanwhile, what do we do about the noun here? Now, would the vice chair of scrutiny take back to the chair of scrutiny with the other members of scrutiny what's been said around this committee so we can get something established, even if it is just an agenda item of the next scrutiny meeting? If that's all we can get, that's all we can get. But if Anne's going to look at the constitution with us, and we're going to review the constitution, maybe there's a good argument. And there are other councillors who have mentioned this, this isn't my idea, but other councillors have suggested that there might be scope to have a major projects committee of this council. Um, and if that's something to take on board, then maybe we should. At least then, other, then, at least then backbenchers would have oversight of things and it not just rely on the cabinet. Right, one for, for Ellie then. Um, if you can make a note in the minutes that the vice chair of scrutiny is taking back to scrutiny um, the fact that there should possibly be oversight committees on major projects. Graham, can you manage that? And 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 I and I go back to page 129, principle four, mm. an overview to ensure that. That, that some oversight establishes that the interventions are determined that are necessary to optimize the achievement of the intended outcomes with regard to these very large projects. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm happy to take the recommendation. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I'm happy to take that back for scrutiny. And maybe what it, it really needs to go to then is to is to cabinet because it the overview committee needs to look at what's going on. The trouble with scrutiny, etc., is it looks at the history when it's all a bit too late. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'll take that back to the chair of scrutiny and put it on the agenda and then see how we can run with that. It might need to go from scrutiny to cabinet and take Indeed. that. Councillor Harvey's shaking his head. Councillor Harvey? I don't mean to be disrespectful to Cabinet. This is not the point, all right? Don't take it as an offence to any Cabinet members listening in, but they shouldn't be marking their own homework. If this is going to be a process for backbenchers to be involved in a committee of some kind to oversee major projects, then that's where it, the decision should rest. It shouldn't be for Cabinet to decide whether or not we have oversight of their major projects we should be able to say, shouldn't we? And I don't know whether this fits into Anne's constitutional review and, and where things are at, and forgive me, I'm ignorant to that and I apologise, but maybe that can be something we consider in the future, because the Many Down Overview Committee has been very successful, particularly at generating cross-party working. Which goes back to my original suggestion that it should go through scrutiny, and um, the recommendations come from there. Right, anybody, uh, sorry, Kim? No. Okay, paper 11, once again, is for us to approve. We're happy with it as it stands, with all the comments we've made. Okay. Um, Chair, I, I did have my hand up at the end of the last item, but uh, you obviously Nick, missed it. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed you. Please go ahead. Not a problem. Um, as Councillor Harvey's already almost said we've already got a major product um, projects committee at the moment it's called mock and certainly over the last couple of years i've felt it's been underworked and now that may be different in the future but we could um reposition the mock committee into a major project projects committee i don't think we need another committee when we've already got one committee set up already that just needs renaming to cover the other issues 
Uh, I think this needs to be done as part of the constitution review and um, the whole role of scrutiny and you know whether we have the same number of scrutiny committees or whether we have one overarching scrutiny committee that set, then sets up specific committees underneath it all needs to be looked at and discussed with members, you know, especially in light of the fact that the number of councillors is reducing to service all of these committees. And I know it's something that um, Fiona is going to be um, probably getting the Constitution Working Party back together so that we can look at these in the round to make sure that we've got it fit for, you know, next May in the Constitution. Yeah, that, that's why, as I say, long -term just term solution, but I think in the short the term, new committee, we've already got one. <laughs> Thank you. I think in the short term, scrutiny, having a look at it first, might be the, the answer. Long term, the constitution possibly is, but everything will change next year with a smaller council. Well, now the whole committee structure is up for grabs, I suspect. Okay, we can move on to twelve. We could get rid of the capital. Well, that's a from 12 being a mere 100 pages. <laughs> Welcome to uh, Richard Bevin, who is going to present the report. Um, and uh, we can then decide which bits of it we are going to concentrate our time on. Over to you, Richard. Thank you, Councillor Gardner. Uh, yes, so uh, this is the uh, progress report for the work that's um, been completed by the internal audit team uh, covering March to May this year, um, as well as the work which we completed between December last year and February um, that would have been reported to the, um, the committee that was cancelled in, in March. Uh, all this work represents completion of the um, uh, 1920 audit plan work. And the completed audits, they're summarised in two tables. Uh, they're on pages 148 and 149. And you'll see from there of the audits, there's seven full assurances, eight substantial, three reasonable and one limited assurance. Um, and the summary reports for these are all, all shown in my appendices to all the way through to appendix 20. Um, so I make no apologies for that. It does represent a huge chunk of our, our work for the year. Um, to remind the committee um, that the audits where we give a full or substantial assurance um, where we've had no significant control issues or weaknesses, we feel there's none, there's none there and advise committee to focus on the ones where we've given a reasonable or limited assurance. Um, as well as the reports, the, um, my report also uh, covers the latest position, position with regards to um, outstanding audit recommendations and appendix one of my, my report, first of many, um, on page 153 um, shows we got 20, 52 recommendations in total that are listed, of which 26 are overdue for completion and 26 are currently not overdue. Um, I'm proposed to say any more, but I'm happy to try and answer any questions that you may have. When we talk about overdue recommendations, I think the COVID-19 situation has certainly had an impact everybody nodding there so definitely right I have looked at page 148 and 149 and the majority of the reports are either substantial or full uh, compliance which is good news however the ones which might be worth looking at software licensing which is only reasonable risk management which is certainly an area that we were con concerned about and we did push for an audit report on. So it'd be interesting to look at that. Uh, HR was only reasonable. Certainly the, the new HR um, director has chased to uh, get a lot of that implemented. And on page 149, business continuity is only reasonable. GIS was limited. And corporate governance is relevant because we have just been looking at corporate governance. So if anybody wants to add anything to that. No. So starting with Appendix 1, which is the overdue. Mr Chairman, Mr Chairman. 
Sorry, if we if if we would um, if you would if you wouldn't mind just um, uh, also enabling us as a committee to see the procurement and contracts and just talk a little bit about that because certainly as a result of um, the pandemic it's certainly an an area that has shown itself to have presented issues in other government uh, organisations and I'd love it if we could just touch on our procurement and contract uh department and how big um the size of the the value of the contracts go up to certainly only it's not a question of can we i couldn't stop you if you wanted to <laughs> that's a job with your your job as a pretty member so we can certainly look at anything you want uh so appendix one if we can just touch on that Anybody got any questions on the overdue position? No, let's take it as a statement of fact. Sorry, on, on, on appendix one, I did have a query with regards to procurement and contracts. So there is a theme uh, which I'd already identified. Um, uh, you've made a we'll reference. We come to that when we look at the actual report. Okay. Okay. Which you've asked us to do anyway. So appendix one, we're happy with as it stands, subject to looking at procurement. Software licensing, reasonable assurance. Uh, Richard, can you talk us through that one? Uh, I, I guess, Chair, yeah, the, the main points um, from that um, is the first time we've actually looked at software licensing in anger. And as we usually find um, when we look at something for the first time, it's usually a good opportunity for a position statement uh, as to where we are. The issue with software licensing, what we've found is it's it's kind of evolved over a period of time. It used to be centralized control by IT many years ago. Then it kind of got sort of uh, dissolved out to, to, to the services. Some took them on board um, and some went back to the IT service. I, I, th I think um, uh, there's been an assumption by services that it's the responsibility of IT to, to monitor these sort of things, which is probably it's probably logical, but perhaps not, perhaps a bit unfair on, on IT. Um, I did notice that in the annual governance statement, um, uh, that is recognised as one of the, the significant governance issues that are raised. So um, I would hope that uh, um, as a result of the audit, um, that, that, you know, the, the profile of the, the issue has been raised. Um, so I, I think it's important to say as well, the, the issue of um, sort of like Microsoft licenses, I think IT um, have got it, have got it bang on. I think they manage that very well. Um, the, the issue is around like the legacy systems that we have and how they have been, the governance arrangements around them um, have evolved over time. And I think it's a matter of uh, grasping the situation and uh, coming to a decision as to how it's done. Is it done centrally or should it be decentralised? Um, and I think as long as a decision's made either way, um, then we go with it. But it will take time to to basically get it, get all the information in. We don't know what we don't know. Um, also, a lot of information kind of left with officers as officers have gone over the years. Um, their knowledge has also gone and we've been trying to pick up the pieces a bit. So it has been recognised. Um, uh, I think IT have done a good job on the Microsoft side of things. It's these legacy systems. I think we need to we need to bottom out. Thank you. Appendix five was the risk management arrangements, which you said was. Uh, Level of assurance was substantial, so you were happy with what was happening there. But once again, can you just talk us through the various uh, control objectives, exactly what it is that the risk management is supposed to be doing, 
and how that is being covered? Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. So, so this was um, we were asked to do the, the risk management. Previously, we, we've we've done it uh, bits of it, um, different elements of risk throughout the year, um, and this audit we we're asked to basically do like a cradle to grave kind of review. So, so we looked at control objective one was uh, checking whether we actually had a risk management policy, whether it was up to date. Then it was actually looking at the corporate risk register going down to the, uh, the, the service risks and then also on to the council's uh, specific project risks. Um, I, I really, my, my findings are, are summarized on pages 180 to 181 um, of my report. Um, going, up, sorry, going up to page 182 as well. Um, I haven't really got anything more to add other than what's in, in the report there, Chair. Okay, on um, control objective two, the next review in February 2020, interestingly enough, I think we've had February 2020, would be an opportunity to review more vigorously the corporate risk register scores. How is that going? Um, I, I Andrew? Paul, Paul, Paul probably wants to, wants to jump Paul in at this waving, point. yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, that review was carried out by SLT in February. It was due to be presented to audit committee back in March, but as we know, that committee was cancelled. Uh, so the next opportunity for that to come to committee is the next committee, which is September. Um, so I'm more than happy to share with the committee what was um, the, the report that was scheduled for March off record, so you can see it in prep for September, if that helps in any way. Thank you, I accept that. Uh, Councillor Cubitt, risk is something that you're always concerned about. Have you got any comment? Yeah, no, I'm just very um, briefly, because you're absolutely right, we've had long, lengthy conversations about this. And in fact, um, we talked at length about that chart, which the, um, the paid service get with the yellow and the green and the red and where there's identified risks, etc. And you've categorised the project risks in your control objective four. Uh, and then you've made a statement, which is that they are subject to appropriate scrutiny. Now, um, I think you were in on the previous discussion, and we've been saying that we don't think that they are currently being scrutinised any other than via um, um, a cabinet, with the exception of the many down. So that statement, they are subject to appropriate scrutiny. Uh, where does that, what are you referring to when you state that? Mr Gundry wishes to speak. Yeah, thank you. Jump in there, Richard. Sorry um, that this is primarily based around the uh, constitution arrangements and the previously um, mentioned at this committee about the performance panel. And again, I've heard the conversations that, that have had, we've had today uh, around performance panel. Um, but in terms of the, the committee, uh, the audit that we've done, it was uh, looking at what the constitution says, who's got responsibility for what, and uh, looking at what performance panel actually uh, carry out. Okay, so we've looked at the, the risk report. We're happy that uh, it is substantial, but still there is some scope for further oversight. And we look forward to seeing the results of the review. So that was fine. Um, HR, appendix nine. Again, uh, Chair, I, I think the um, sort of the, the the bullet points were on page one nine six of um, the report. Now, um, they they summarise. I think the main thing probably is uh, governance arrangements. We, we did identify there was a lot of uh, policies which are due for review. It doesn't mean they're they're inaccurate, of course, but it just means that they, they haven't been reviewed. A uh, situation that wasn't helped by the. Um, we had a couple of went through a couple of different heads of heads of department in the time, so there was no consistency in the, in, in the leadership there. But we've agreed we've agreed this report with Sarah Craig um, in some depth, and she's provided some comprehensive responses. Um, agreed to the timescales for the recommendations. So hopefully, again, that gave her a position statement as to where where the department was, and she can use that to to move forward. 
All right, I've just lost page 149. <laughs> Anybody else there got page 149 and just tell me which appendices we were looking at next. No further comments on HR is there? No. Business continuity, I think. Yeah, uh, number yes, 11. Yes, business continuity. Thank yeah. you. So business continuity. Uh, I, I think with, with this one, uh, I, again, policies have been in place um, for quite some time, but since um, since the departure of the previous policy and performance manager um, back in 2018, uh, the, 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 I think it's just a gen been a general lack of ownership, lack of governance um, around it, which um, this area has also been picked up by, by Sarah, um, Sarah Craig. Uh, and again, she's agreed that the recommendations that we've made um to take it forward so it's kind of been uh, has been drifting a bit and of course the issue of business continu continuity has been highlighted um, quite significantly by the current situation uh, that we're in one, one of the areas that we've always made comments about is um uh, no real solid sort of testing of the, these plans um there's always been services have always been uh, uh short of resources to be able to try and do anything of any significance um the it department have done some um sort of like proper sort of continuity uh, disaster recovery tests um recently well, recently um which i believe have been successful and i think the lack of downtime that we've had generally indicates that things are working up solidly there um but again hopefully under sarah's um leadership now we hopefully might see some some sort of more progress um on this uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I was seriously disappointed um, with this particular review. Um, maybe, uh, maybe it's unreasonable, but I, I always thought there was a need for business continuity in most winters, one way or another. So I was disappointed with this. And just reflecting on the fact that um, a cause appears to be staff turnover and um, as was a, the HR uh, review, I would just like to ask that we check our risk register. Um, I apologize, I haven't done it myself, but to check that our risk register reflects the fact that staff turnover is impacting on um, some of our governance and uh, actually you know, you're right, you know, the, with the HR, yes, a lot of policies may be out of date, but the consequences, if we have got something wrong in those policies, can be quite severe. And I, I think this business continuity one is the same. I think, you know, we, we, we don't keep on top of these things at our peril, really. So we'd just like to make sure that we're recognising that we, we should be doing something when people leave about ensuring these things don't get lost. Mr. Gundry. Um, thank you, Chair. Just want to give some assurance there that um, staffing is the number one risk register in the corporate risk register. Well, Catherine, for Mr. Gundry, and how is that mitigated? Uh, well, <laughs> we've got a few there. Um, we have uh, things around people strategy, uh, pay policy statements, um, staff engagement uh, surveys, because obviously we want to understand why people are leaving. Um, we have framework communication, uh, commitment to supporting staff's health and well-being. Uh, there's a few more that I could um, share with you. But when, so when I send out the uh, corporate risk register as discussed earlier, um, you'll see them there as well. Do we have a look at how mitigation actually works in practice? Uh, we do indeed. That was part of the risk management audit that uh, Richard introduced uh, uh, about five, ten minutes ago, where we did actually look at mitigations of some, corporate, some of the corporate risks. And spe specifically, sorry, Chair, on, on, um, on, on the report itself, one of the recommendations we, we have made that the uh, 
uh, should be ensured the controls identified within the corporate risk register for business continuity, which is the ninth one, are implemented, uh, are implemented and are effective in mitigating the likelihood of business continuity failure. Um, so that there is a, there was a business continuity board, um, but again, since the departure of the lead officer back in 2018, that's when the governance kind of kind of sort of fell away a bit. So we have highlighted it, um, and hopefully, it will be now picked up. I like the word hopefully. It will now be picked up. <laughs> Councillor Bo. Yeah, if I could come back, please. I think there's a difference between having on the risk register something about reducing our staff turnover. Absolutely. Um, and yes, there should be something on, on, on our actions about standing back up the business continuity work. Um, so I apologise. I don't think I've got my point over well enough. The point is that when people have left, things have slipped. So we, we should be thinking about what we do going forward when people leave to ensure that these kinds of things don't slip through the net. This, this is a, um, because this is two examples we've, we've just had in front of us where people uh, in, in significant posts have left and there is there could be a myriad of reasons why uh, all sorts of reasons. Probably the most obvious is there's a lack of resource within the council or um, if we bring in interim help, how much they can do. But, but you know, there's one or two obvious things, but it might be something else. But it appears to me that we need to do something about ensuring issues like these don't fall through the gaps when we have staff turnover. Right, I've got Mr Gundry here, but um, certainly what, I, what we want to try and avoid is having new staff come in to, uh, to reinvent the wheel every time. Indeed, Chair, and we sort of touched upon that earlier, but uh, we do have a HR audit um, um, part, way, part way through this year, providing the committee approve the plan in the next agenda item, so we can make sure part of the scope there is uh, about proper handover uh, processes and procedures, um, so we'll make sure we've got that in the scope uh, for councillor votes. Yeah, it certainly is the briefing of new members to make sure that... Uh, we don't lose knowledge on the way. Uh, Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Chair. I mean, I, I think just to pick up uh, a little bit more on what uh, Councillor Vaux was saying, that that a, a lot of um, what Mr Granny was set, talking about is very much what I would call more geared towards the operational staff levels, where it becomes a really significant issue of corporate risk is where we have uh, high turnover and loss of senior staff because those are the levels where we start to see these kind of problems where major policy issues major risk elements and all those things get dropped away. So I think there is a difference between a ass general assessment of staff levels and staff turnover and an assessment of co the corporate strategic impact and business impact of more senior staff. And I think they do, you know, in a lot of organisations, those two things are considered separately. And one of those mitigating factors for senior staff frequently is mentorship within the organization because that forms part of succession planning that is not to say that those succession plans are anointing somebody who takes over the place the point of those schemes is to make sure that the information knowledge and experience within the organization is not lost um, and I'm not not aware of, of the fact that of whether or not we do assess this risk in terms of senior staff loss and operational staff loss and turnover uh, uh, separately, whether we assess that separately in terms of knowledge gap and how we uh, think about systems like mentoring. Uh, that can take place within organisations uh, to future proof things like uh, loss of, of knowledge and experience. And so I think it is worth looking at that in, in some way, if you can. 
I think you're right. Well, I think it's a matter of where do we send that request. I think it's worth just um, including in the minutes, Ellie, so that there is a, a need for HR to take that into account. Has anybody else had a hand up? Yes, sorry, Councillor Harvey. Well, picking up my, my two colleagues' points, I don't think it's just HR. With all due respect, I think HR have got the critical role here. But I personally see this resting with SLT. Unless SLT take on board the issues associated with high staff turnover, the evidence that might be gathered from exit interviews or take the issue on board as to why there is a high turnover of staff and the implications of all of that, then it's a responsibility, as I personally see it, and I've always understood it, as being amongst SLT to lead the way in then helping shape a response to that in a way that helps both of what my colleagues have just said, uh, which I couldn't agree with more. So, you know, with Councillor Taylor and Councillor Vox, I just, I think for me personally, I, I, I would do believe it believes it has to rest with SLT in that regard and us as members to support them in that, in supporting our staff. And there's that kind of cultural issue that goes along with this. So yeah, that, that's the way I would, I don't know whether we can do that or what was the appropriate route, but that's where I see it at least anyway. Uh, Mr. Hood, um, do you think you could feed that back through to SLT for us? Yes, certainly, Chair. Good, we've got, got a nice positive response there. Hmm. Okay, that was uh, business continuity. <laughs> we've still got GIS, Appendix 12. Richard, you so, work too by GIS. Yeah, sure. So the, the GIS now uh, I have to consider. I, I did the work on this in in February, um, and as I've highlighted in the report, basically no no governance arrangements um, kind of existed with regards to the, the GIS, the management of it. I, I have to say the thing that came out of the audit was um, I have to give credit to the diligence of the officers that operate the, the GIS system. Um, I, I refer in there to concerns over uh, inconsistency and potentially inaccurate data layers within the GIS system. But I, I, I think, uh, and also how officers have developed their own, their own sort of systems and processes. Um, if I hadn't done that, we would probably have been in a bigger mess. Um, uh, so I think credit's due to the officers that have um, have managed it and indeed one of the main officers who was responsible for the system within the planning department was at the time I was doing the audit was seconded over to the IT department to actually sort of lead on on the projects um, to sort it out um, now I haven't had any more updates um, since then um, on that so uh, again I don't use the word hope but I, I would expect um, that some progress has been made on that since um uh since february but of course what with the uh, us in lockdown and everything getting the information um uh it hasn't been hasn't been as easy so yes at the time um it was uh, it was a bit of a worry hence the limited assurance it's was pulled back up we haven't given too many limited assurances in the last few years um but that was one that was quite a concern um so uh i hope that the next committee we'll be able to get some update as to, um, as to the work that's been done done on it. But you don't anticipate that the um, concerns are going to be addressed before the next meeting? Well, I would I would hope that some of them probably already have been here. I'd say we're now into the sort of end of June, if we're four months on since I completed uh, the, the work, I, I suppose sort of two, two months since the, I finalised the report. Um, Yes, if I'm honest, I, I, I doubt there's been a, a huge, massive developments, but I'm sure some progress has has been made. Um, yeah, some progress, yeah. I can believe, but jumping from limited to substantial in the course of a couple of months seems a, a big ask. Uh, yeah, I would say so, yeah. <laughs> right, Councillor Harvey and then Councillor Cubit. Thanks. On this one, my concern when reading it really was having experienced the system when it was set up with the old regen team that led in terms of setting up the GIS, then having them as it were disbanded and got rid of, there was a sense of, well, okay, now who's gonna own this, where does it go? And other officers have stepped in and done a really good job of trying to deal with what they were landed with, but there didn't seem to be any succession planning 
in terms of here we've created something that is incredibly useful to us as ward councillors that's incredibly useful to the ops team to all those other to, to most parts of the council actually but it seems to me and maybe i'm wrong on this but it, it, nobody seemed to own it or was given it to own or was allowed to take simply because the policy was you know we're not doing regen in that way anymore and it kind of dropped away now maybe i've misunderstood that maybe that isn't the case at all um but going forward is it going to rest under a particular person's responsibility because for example does it talk to Vivid? And at the moment, I know Vivid of their system, Sovereign of their system, we have ours and so on. And they're not easily talking to each other. So the utility of GIS is an issue as a member that I've come across and I know our own teams have come across. So where does that fit in this whole moving from? Well, you certainly I would, I would say the first thing we do is note in the, the minutes that the uh, utility of GIS is an issue. I certainly like your choice of words. And that is something that needs to be addressed once again, SLT perhaps. So that one can be referred up. Thank you for that, Paul. Can I just uh, say, yeah, uh, I don't mean that as a criticism in any way. Of absolutely any, not. Because they've done, the, it really is, but it's an incredibly useful tool. And it could be more useful. Uh, right, Onnelly was next. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I don't know, and, and, and I'm happy for the committee to agree or disagree with this, but I think maybe it, it, it's something that the cabinet member responsible for this area should actually uh, respond, not SLT, because when you read this, it, it seems to be um, the overview issue, um, and I don't know who owns it more, whether it should be a cabinet member that should be the one that responds and not SLT in this instance. I'm quite happy to um, put a recommendation down from this committee that the cabinet member report report back to us on it. Councillor Bow, is that is that a request to speak? No, Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, I just really want to pick up on a point that Councillor Harvey Harvey said there, really about. Um, sort of usage I guess I mean it is an incredibly important tool to councillors to enable us to do our work so so it actually has really high value um however there is you know and this is not a criticism of of the, the hard work that goes into it but it doesn't work very well on a diff on different platforms so unless you happen to have an ipad unless you happen to be able to log into the systems network you don't get most of the layers you don't get most of the facilities and to be honest with you with you you could at times you know nip off and actually draw a map yourself in in the amount of time it takes to load up um, and 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 I know that it works brilliantly when you've got it on an iPad. I've I've watched it with other colleagues, and I often get uh, a, a great deal of help from other officers and everybody who do the, do it for me because I don't have an iPad. But um, it, so it, but it is incredibly useful. I don't have an iPad for medical reasons, uh, Councillor Robinson. Before anybody tell, tells me off, we're not having one. Um, but but it is but i just wanted to emphasize how important uh, this is to the work of councillors and to, and to fielding residents uh problems questions and and inquiries and 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 therefore getting proper oversight of it and and support for making it work i think is pretty important all right richard mr Beverly. I, I was just going to say one of the issues the officers reported um that, uh, what was using different versions of, of the system um uh again the, the development the updates of it um they've done very ad hoc so some officers were working on slightly newer version than, than others um which has different functionality different services were again um, councillor taylor they mentioned about response times some were were literally saying load something up go off and get a cup of tea and come back that, that sort of scenario was was reported it you know it's not a um it's not made up uh so they are there are functionality issues there um and then depending on what device you have um does have an effect as well um i, I would expect it to be something taken forward by the um the transformation um team the head of um I forget the, the head of service, but who's responsible? Improvement and trans. Paul will remind me properly. Um, 
I would expect it to be within that that team to be led by by IT. Paul, Mr. Gundry. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, it's the, the head of uh, transformation improvement who's taken responsibility for the recommendations that's uh, detailed in page uh, two hundred and twelve. So he's taken ownership of the recommendations, and uh, it, just to sort of make the committee aware, it was our chief executive who originally raised the concern of GIS was in the first place. He's the one who asked for that to be in the audit um, audit plan last year. So, yes, there is um, awareness at SLT level. I think it might be worthwhile from the comments of the committee to actually ask the portfolio holder to come back to us at our next meeting in September with an update on the status of GIS. Seem to have some agreement on that. Yep. Okay. If we can move on to Appendix 14, procurement and contract processes. The floor is yours, Councillor Cubitt. Again, so thank you. Um, I mean, as I, um, I just touched on, um, uh, I mean, you've given it a substantial assurance. That's great. I'm glad you're happy. Uh, there does seem to be a personnel issue again with, um, is there somebody being recruited again? Um, and I don't know whether you feel there's risks in the interim when we don't have that person in situ. And um, um, committee, I just wondered, because um, again, this, this is an historic audit, but very specifically with regards to the contract that we have with Serco, for example. Um, I just wonder what um, uh, colleagues think about um, a contract like that when during the pandemic, the delivery service changed, whether the contract in question uh, in terms of performance under the contracts mean that we are due monies and who, who, who's responsible for checking whether as a result of failure to uh, deliver the contract as per the signed terms and, uh, and conditions um, is something that we will be following up on. Who wants to respond to that one? Okay, Paul, Mr. Gundry. So I thought he was asking councillors for other responses then. Um, yeah, we do have uh, that the uh, contract mentioned in the audit plan for next year. And uh, we did look at the contracts um, for last year, which was looking at the payments, which I believe is in the, in the report pack, just trying to find which appendix it is. Um, sorry, appendix 19, Paul. 19. So appendix 19 that we did look at the payments um, last year, if that's any help to councillors. Members, yeah. do you think that we ought to have a special um, issue? Is it relevant to our committee or is it another committee as to performances of contracts, big significant contracts during this pandemic? and whether financially we've got redress for failures to perform under those contracts. I think that's really one for Philip. What do you think, Philip? Um, I, think, I think it's one you've got to be careful about the role of the the committee, um, whether you're, whether again, is this a role for the committee to get involved in the... I'm referring it to you, with a particular maybe it's a financial issue rather than an issue for the committee. Um, well, I mean, we have got a contracts and procurement section that um, have got a register of the contracts. Um, I don't know quite ask what to say, um, but you, you're after someone to potentially look, look through all the contracts and to see whether the, uh, I don't know, the clauses that relate, relate to underperformance are, are adequate. I think um, I'd be worried if we had underperformance and we weren't checking the contract to see what redress we had. Yeah, fulfilment under the contracts. Uh, 
I'll just chair, I might just say perhaps I don't, it's something, a question for the, the procurement team that might be able to help. I don't know if Anne would be able to advise if she's, because Anne, uh, it's not Anne, it's um, head of legal, is I think, or uh, the monitoring okay, Anne, the buck has responsible been for you. procurement contracts. I think um, performance of the contract, any contract, is a matter for the contract officer, isn't it, in monitoring the terms of the contract? And if there are underperformance in the contract, then there are usually a range of remedial steps that could be taken that are prescribed by the contract that the officer would routinely, you know, implement things like default notices or non-performance notices. Uh, so I don't think it's really something um, that the committee would usually get involved in on a day to day basis. I think the main concern was that somebody was involved. Yes, I think it's uh, it is an officer's role. Um, you know, the contract officer under a contract would have that role. Councillor Kubit, do you want any further comment? Yeah, no, I wasn't seeking for us to look into it. It was just a fair question in view of the pandemic and in view of the fact that contracts that we've signed, like Serco and the Bins went from all, uh, you know, weekly to alternate weeks, whether, whether somebody somewhere is overviewing whether the contract which has not been performed as per its original intent is being looked at. But um, if everybody's relatively relaxed, I saw that Councillor Harvey put his hand up, but otherwise I'm, I, you know, I'm just flagging it because that was a significant change in delivery of service for a very significant contract. Uh, oh, and subject, that's the only reason why I'm joking. is well on top of that one. Thanks, Cuba, it was looked at and, um, you know, there are mechanisms in the contract for when, you know, force majeure events occur, um, which enable them to make those changes. And there were a number of governance decisions taken in relation to those to enable things to, um, you know, proceed as they needed to at the time. Councillor Harvey. It's just a, a scrutiny point, I guess. I mean, when scrutiny attempted to look at the waste contract, it got a report. It was quite a high level report. It had the council leader come to the committee and there was a discussion around the performance of the contract way before COVID was even on the agenda, even an issue for us to, to face to. And the level of that detail that scrutiny could go into was actually fairly limited. Um, the officers obviously get far more detail. They're day to day. They are exactly as Ad describes it, performing their roles exactly as we would expect them to in monitoring the contracts on a day to day basis. On, the bay, on implementing all the clauses that would be within, implementing all the issues that would be there. I guess the question is, if it's just purely the cabinet member that's overseeing the contract, it was the cabinet member that agreed the contract in the first place with those officers that procured it in the first place. And again, we're back into the same argument of who's marking whose work here. Uh, I know performance panel have raised this, but they only look at the KPIs. They can only look at the agreed areas. They've pushed that agenda though. I mean, I know they have because Councillor Ashfield has done that. Well, the question is perhaps for our oversight again, who gets to oversee just how good things are? And if scrutiny can't get a more detailed report or can't do that in detail, is that an issue we need to take up somewhere else? I think Councillor Cupid has raised a very important point and I don't know where it goes, but it shouldn't be left because the waste contract's the biggest one we've got and probably causes the residents the most headaches at the moment and a variety of... <laughs> so somebody needs to pick it up and look at it that isn't the cabinet. They cannot... Yeah, the waste contract, I would have thought that any member of CEP can stick it on the agenda and sh should do. And you keep asking questions until you get answers. Do not get fobbed off by officers. But that also begs the question, Chair, that the committee is serviced in a way that it gets the ability to really look at the issue in the way it wants to. It, it needs to ask the right questions and make sure it gets answers. Chair, yeah, I think scrutiny has looked at the waste contract, hasn't it? Over the recent year, the, the particular issue with the bin, scrutiny did examine it. and. That's the way scrutiny works. If there is a specific issue that comes to members' concern, then scrutiny is there to enable you to ask questions and explore that issue. But that's not the same as members having, um, you know, overview of detailed elements of the contract. You know, it, it works that officers monitor that contract, and you know, officers have to be trusted to bring issues to members' attention if there are issues, rather than hiding them. And, you know that's the role of the committee it's that the oversight officers do the the detailed donkey work really 
Oh, I quite agree with that. But once again, it's a matter of if members have questions, they should ask them and make sure they get answers. Councillor Taylor. Thank you very much. I mean, um, I'm, I'm not sure if this is right uh, for scrutiny. It may well be um, that at some point there will need to be scrutiny of um, a lot of decisions made during the pandemic because they haven't been, you know, they, it might be something that we want want to do, particularly decisions made under emergency powers. Um, I mean, I'm brand new onto scrutiny, so I'm, I don't know that. I'm only sort of positing that that might be a possibility. And I would imagine that um, a decision would have been made about uh, about us agreeing with our suppliers uh, to reduce uh, waste collections and, and suspend various uh, types of collections. And so that might fall uh, due to be looked at by scrutiny on, on that basis. I mean, it's perhaps something that uh, myself and Councillor Faulkner can, can take away to ask with the, the chair of, of scrutiny just to, to understand whether that is the right place for it. Uh, if not, I'm, I'm sure those of us that are on CEP can make an adequate nuisance of, our, of ourselves. Um, so I just sort of leave that leave that there. I mean, Anne, Anne might be able to comment on that, but I did have a specific question that I'd like to come back to um, on the um, procurement um, uh, audit, if I if I may. Oh, please get back onto the agenda. <laughs> Sorry, on the um, urgency decisions and uh, scrutiny. Um, you can't call in urgency decisions in the sense to. Um, to stop them being implemented. Um, you know, the urgency decisions are exactly that. They need to be taken and they're not subject to scrutiny. Notwithstanding that, however, um, I understand that scrutiny has asked for a report on the governance decisions that have been taken during the pandemic period. So you should get an oversight of the measures that officers put into place to get us through that very difficult period. But it, it's not to, you can't stop the implementation of those decisions. It's more to see what had happened and how we coped with it. Okay, Councillor Taylor. Uh, thank you. I mean, I, I say I wasn't too sure where, where that would sit and how that would work. Um, but t turning back to this uh, Appendix 14 and Control Objective 1, if I may, just to ask a question about what gets looked at. Um, and I, I apologise for getting into the nitty gritty. Um, with respect to forming a contract, you obviously review the processes of how that gets done. Is one of the things that gets looked at in those processes is whether or not there are controls and checks about the legal identity of the parties to contracts. In other words, are they who they say they are? Do they have a company number? Um, and, and so on, because, because that is actually pretty important. Um, I don't know if this is really one for Phil rather than me, but when the council enters into contracts, there will be a number of searches done, you know, financial checks will be done on the parties before we enter into contract. Companies register will be searched. Um, appropriate reports will be got from um, credit providers, etc. So yes, that would routinely be done. Um, there might be an issue of a bond or a parent company guarantee to give the council security as well. Can you say something, Richard? Uh, no, I was just going to say with uh, exactly what Anne has just said, really, um, the checks that are undertaken um, it, through company's house and, and everything. So no, nothing more to add to what Anne said. OK, moving on. Uh, property fixed asset register. I'm delighted that we have substantial assurance after the many problems we've had in the past. And if we could just note Appendix 20, which is the Corporate Governance Audit Summary Report. The latest version of the Council's Local Code of Corporate Governance should be published on the Council's website as a recommendation. <laughs> I thought it was. Um, apart from that, we got full assurance. So that was good news as far as that's concerned. I think that is probably it on paper 12. Any other comments from anybody? All right. Yeah.
Internal Audit Annual Report. That has got to be Mr Gundry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, this is the, the report is a standard format as previous years, uh, which is uh, me giving the noting, uh, sorry, apologies, uh, providing the committee with my uh, opinion on the effectiveness of the Council's risk management and control of governance processes for last year. Um, it's based on the work that's been carried out by internal audit during the year, and you'll find the, the summary of the work that's carried out on Appendix 1, which is page 251. So each audit assignment is carried out plus the assurance level given. Um, so in, in summary, my uh, opinion is of a substantial assurance uh, for last year, and that's uh, detailed in page, paragraph 5.4 on page 248. Um, no more, I wasn't going to raise any other uh, comments, so Chair, but over to questions if there are any. Well, just one, one comment was on page 247 on the chart. I noticed the top of the chart is in blue, which was um, no assurance, but I think that's just a mistake. <laughs> I don't remember any no, occasion. That, that, it's, there, it should, it's the very, very top level. It's meant to represent a zero, um, Just, but yes, it is a zero. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anybody got any comments on that? Councillor Kiewicz. Sorry, same, same old, same old. Appendix two, um, other key audits, um, and you've got down there, uh, Basic View Development, last done full audit 2016. When's that next scheduled for? Um, we haven't got that down as a separate audit, but we'll pick that up as part of our project management uh, audit that we've got set aside for this year. Right, and then on the Leisure Park Development Agreement, you've got no opinion required. What on earth does that mean? So that relates to 2018-19 rather than um, last year. So that's just giving you a, a five-year um, okay. snapshot. So, I, I mean, I, I don't, I, you know, I listen, don't want to bore everybody, but you've all heard my views from the very get-go of this meeting. I would like to see date somewhere for Basing View for um, the Leisure Park to have uh, a, 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 a deepened, a deepened um, thorough um, audit in terms of performance of its uh, partnership agreement, development agreement, and uh, all that lies within. Second to chair. Sorry, Councillor Harvey. Maybe agree with Councillor Cubit, and that way it gets recorded, doesn't it? Because two of us have said agreed. That's agreed. Okay, internal audit plan 2020-21. Yep. He's approving. Yeah, thank you, Chair. That's, that's me again. This was due to come to the uh, committee back in March, which was cancelled. Um, so I bought it here. Uh, so I'm looking for the committee to approve my work programme, which could be found on page 269 of Appendix 2. Um, and I'm also going to ask the committee to approve the internal audit charter for this year. Um, and that can be found uh, on, uh, on appendix one at 200, page 261. And the, there's some minor changes to the one that's approved last year and they're detailed in paragraph 3.2, which can be found in, on page 258. Right, any comments? Councillor Bow. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just referring to Appendix 2 on page 269. Um, I, I'm, are these, is this a complete list of the audits that are going to be carried out? Because it, it appeared that these were all ones that were carried out either annually or, or every two years or something. And I, and I was looking to see when the business continuity one would come up again, given concerns about the audit, the previous audit paper. Thank you. Yeah, um, that won't, we haven't put that in for this year because we will monitor the recommendations through the recommendation process from last year. So on the basis that those, those recommendations were implemented, I'd be happy not to cover it again this year. So we would probably add it onto the audit plan uh, next financial year. 
I, I would like it to be added for the following year, please. Anybody else got a thought on that? Seems to be you're the only one. Um, I would agree. I completely agree with that. Completely agree with Councillor Fox on that. <laughs> Thank you. It's nice to get some contribution coming in. Okay. So certainly the committee are in favour of that happening. So I would put that forward to you to add to the list. Paul? So yep. Jeff, I'd just clarify um, what was recommended because uh, I don't know whether the councillor was agreeing for it to be in next year's plan or this year's plan. Ne next year's plan. Okay, thank you. All right. I have got uh, Councillor Harvey and then Councillor Cubitt. I'm worried. The point picking up of what we said in the last item with the, the project management bits and picking up the agreement we've got for looking at the major project. Paul, can you just acknowledge that, that you're going to do what we've asked in that regard? Yes, we'll do. Agreement. Honorly is happy. Quite take some doing. <laughs> okay, so we're happy with that change, but apart from that, the audit programme is agreed. Sorry, Chair. Yes, Paul? Chair, can I ask uh, that the committee are uh, appro approving the charter as well? Oh, I think that was definitely an approval. Okay, thank you. I don't think you can go away yet because the next paper is protecting the public purse. And we are supposed to note the report. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, this report builds on the report that's presented to committee on the 9th of December to uh, just inform the committee of the work that's been carried out during 1920 to protect the public purse. Um, I, I believe the report speaks for itself, so I was just going to ask the committee to note the report if they would, please. Thank you. If anybody's got any questions, speak now, otherwise we note the report. We note the report. Hello, Councillor Faulkner. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just raise it now. I think we all got a, an email this morning, <coughs> excuse me, from SIPFA offering us a course or something um, on fraud because apparently in the procurement process, um, a lot of the processes and procedures have been dumped because of the emergency. But there's a great fear that in the public sector, people have gone off buying this, that and t'other and then inadvertently got um, conned, skinned and all the rest of it in doing so. So I just throw that in because we've got protecting the public first, but whether at some stage, at some point, we would look at um, were our activities during the crisis okay or did we dump some of our processes, panic buy PPE or whatever, um, and inadvertently lose a lot of money. I think that is definitely one for Mr. Gundry to answer because it might actually be another work job job for internal audit. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, uh, of course, we acknowledge the, the comment made there by Councillor Faulkner. Um, each of the audit sites we will be carrying out this year, obviously, no doubt there's a COVID 19 implication. Um, so, COVID 19 will be taken into account across all our audit um, assignments, uh, particularly around control environment, see whether and have been binned or whether they've been enhanced in any way. So uh, hopefully the chance to be given to committee uh, throughout the year. Councillor Faulkner, does that satisfy you on that point? Thumbs up. Okay, so anything further to add to that report? We can note it, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Somewhere out there is Jackie Tatum. <laughs> um, we have the Re Regulation Investory Powers Act annual report. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is just the annual report on activities under the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act. Um, in the course of the year, we have had no formal RIPA authorizations. There's been one 
um, authorization under the council's own internal process, um, which has previously been reported to uh, this committee. There have been no changes to legislation and um, there's been a, a refresh and an update of the RIPA e-learning for relevant officers uh, to, it, uh, to, to undertake. It's, it's not a, a training module that's necessary for all staff, but those with a um, enforcement activity, so planning enforcement, etc. Um, so the report is just for note, but happy to take any questions. And I'll just remind members that there is a RIPA e-learning module if you are interested. I've done it and it, it is quite interesting just to uh, understand the process. Apart from that, we can note the report. And we now have the social networking sites. Committee to note the report again. And certainly there has been very little activity um, apart from internal audits being let loose and the dogs um, carried out a couple of Facebook investigations. So I don't think we need comment any further on that. Thank you very much for that, Jackie. General data registration, notification of data breaches reported to the ICO. And the committee is invited to note the improved performance of the council in relation to data breaches reported to the ICO. That's quite a sweeping invitation. Any comments? Well, are we actually happy to note the improved performance? Because um, we actually did have instances where we were reported to the ICO. So I think um, improved in performance is something we aspire to rather than look back on. Any comment? No. Well, I would encourage everybody to actually do, do the GDPR module for councillors. I am told that only eight councillors so far have done it this year, which sounds a little bit grim to me, considering it was specially designed for members to uh, protect themselves. Uh, so anybody who hasn't, please do. It doesn't take very long. So we can note that report as it stands. Thank you. Which takes us on to the work programme, which is fairly routine. I don't know if anybody wants to um, try and put anything into that because uh, I wouldn't say it's sparse, but um, there's not a lot of meat in it. Councillor Kubik. Well, um, I don't know. It seems like an awfully long time ago because this meeting has been quite long, but, but at the very beginning, I asked Martin and Philip and uh, Daniel some questions with regards to the commercial real estate portfolio um, in terms of delinquent um, uh, potential bad debts, in terms of rental arrears, in terms of rent holidays and the impact on the revenue. Um, and I do believe that that would be something that, given they said they're doing it now, and one would expect them to be doing it now, in fact, one would expect them to have a pretty good overview already of where the situation is today. We should probably be told about it in September, but I'm happy to be agreed or disagreed to by my fellow members of this committee. Well, I'm inclined to agree with you, Anneli. <laughs> um, I think that actually having... Um, the impact of COVID-19 on our property portfolio in terms of both, both valuation and rental income is something that will be of great concern to the committee. So Ellie, can you speak to the relevant officers on that with a view to getting your report? Yes, I will do. Uh, and then, Mr. Chairman, if you would indulge again, you might disagree or agree, but I'm still very concerned about even our short term loans to those borough councils when we know that borough councils up and down the country have been borrowing extensive amounts of money in order to buy commercial real estate, which is all underwater now. Now, we're in a very different situation, but it would be very sad if despite the fact we haven't borrowed money to buy commercial real estate and we take a hit on commercial real estate, we then end up getting stung with a loan to um, uh, a borough who has borrowed money 
to extend to commercial real estate. So again, I'm very happy to go with the majority view. If nobody else is interested, that's fine. But I'm a little bit concerned that some of these short-term facilities aren't really short-term facilities. They ship around with Arlen Close in tandem and they move borough councils that are lenders uh, so that it looks like they're short-term facilities and actually they're evergreen hardcore debt. Mr. Hood, can you comment on that? Because I, I think it's probably, I hope it's wrong that we do actually check that short-term borrowing is for short-term purposes. Yeah, I mean, for us, it is entirely separate loans, as we've said before. I'm just going to look on the, uh, we usually do a treasury management update. So it, certainly we got a treasury management mid-year report for December. So, you know, we can do, might put an update in there on the, position of local authorities. It's something we meet monthly and manage as a management team to look at treasury management and to look at advice that comes through. You know, if something comes through urgently, we'll, we'll take, obviously take more urgent action, but we can certainly add something to that December report uh, to give you an update on what the position looks like with local authorities and how COVID-19 has affected investments there. So, certainly we've got position of local authorities in general and the ones we lend to in particular. But I think the question was very much geared around what checks do we do to find out what our short-term loans are used for? We don't do checks to see what the loans are, are for. It's short-term cash that the councils are borrowing, just as they could borrow it from a bank, they borrow it from us instead. And then it has to be repaid on a, a fixed date. There's no terms and conditions about what they use the money for. It goes into their bank along with all their other funds and. Possible, I think, to sort of say it's been used to fund, I don't know, one particular project rather than expenditure in, a, in a, some other area. Mm. Councillor Taylor. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. If I can just pick up on a particular uh, a point that uh, I think uh, Councillor Kubik was making was making very well. It's about the repeat loans to the same councils because that makes it really look like a long-term loan rather than a real short-term loan so you know if we keep giving every six months a, a loan of x amount to council y it's not really a short-term loan is it um and it's quite difficult for us because we have to drag out old papers you know if we get an interim report and it just lists the councils that currently have a loan it's quite difficult for us unless we actually go back to old papers to see who had loans before to know whether or not they are these sort of like constant repeats I appreciate contractually they're separate loans and they might pay us back and then take another loan but I think that if the report in somehow can show you know who who who's had them last year and who's had them this year or who is having them as we okay. get them. Can, can I suggest it's quite, quite a lot of particularly difficult piece of work for the officers, but if we have a report covering, say, the last five years on short term loans, who they were lent to, when they were repaid and whether anything was renewed. I think the, the, the risk probably that I could see is more that they borrow from us for six months and then go and borrow from somebody else for six months. So they're rolling the loan, but not with us. But um, we wouldn't know that. But if we could just have a report on what's happened in the past, I think that's probably going to give us some reassurance on what's happening. Thank you. So that's one for, for Ellie to add to the work programme. And I think, Philip, you could probably get something organised on that for us. Yes, we'll do. Thank you. OK, anything else? In which case, items, ooh, go back to the agenda. Items 20 and 21, there is nothing to worry about. So we can conclude the meeting at 1447.